All right, Ooh. you cock wobbles. What do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> <That was> loud. <laughs> Holy shit. So what type of sponsorship package did Kyle Rittenhouse get from Black Rifle Coffee? Was it, oh. a, was it a, just a discount code or was it a yearly sponsorship? Wow. What a, <laughs> what a shit storm. <laughs> Talk about pissing off everybody in the country at one, one 48 hour. Loop. How did you become aware of that whole thing playing itself out? I woke up, I rolled out of bed Saturday morning. I, I well, hold on. Let me, let me back this up a little bit, which is, I don't know why <laughs> in the fuck anyone in their right mind wants to listen to me to begin with. Like, like I find it I, entertaining. I am literally wearing a shirt with a van on it. It has a dream catcher and Matt, Matt best riding an elk, a cobra, a wolf and a desert scene. Like when did I become somebody that people would even want to listen to outside of a couple different things, which is I love to roast coffee. Like, I mean, I think that's fairly obvious and roast your friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm like, Holy fuck. I don't know why people. I don't know why they even want to hear what the fuck I got to say. I feel the same way. I have a podcast. Not exactly sure why people tune in. I appreciate the fact that they do. However, yeah. I'm still surprised by it. Yeah. So I, I rolled out of bed Saturday morning and uh, I could just, just a landslide of customer service inquiries and things of uh, people just, what the fuck? Why are you guys doing this? And, you know, which there's one side of the country that thinks that it was, it was like, you know, the, the woke mob. And I'm like, no, it was just normal people going, this is super fucked up. Like, why are you guys sponsoring this? And Absent like, almost any accurate information. Correct. They were making that assessment. So there were thousands of people making an assumption or, or some type of an assumption. And, uh, like I had to correct that. It was super easy. I just was like, Hey, we don't sponsor him. Like, <laughs> I mean, Seemed pretty cut and dry. It wasn't as if like we were sitting around in a boardroom. It was like me and Logan Stark, a couple fucking knuckle draggers. Like we just got to make a statement, make sure everybody knows. Dude, you know? I knew shit was sideways when I checked my phone and there was an email, an all hands email that says, if you're contacted by the press, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what in the fuck is yeah. going on on the internet? Yeah. So, you guys sent out an all handser? Oh, yeah. Why didn't you guys just forward the press my phone number? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, we should have. Because I hopped in on your personal thread. I had what I wanted to. I was looking for a chance. I, I saw that to write into somebody and say, "Hey, just because you're an expert at eating ass doesn't mean you have to be an <laughs> asshole." But I couldn't find the correct right. comment to attach that to. So instead, I just I, some random comment. I was you just kind like, of fired for effect. I was like, "No, like this is both." And people are like, "Well, you guys are just friends," it and is. both of you can attest to this. I'm fucking harder on my friends than harder. anybody else. Like, <laughs> yeah, way harder. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I expect no quarter from my friends. I expect right. if I'm fucking up to be told that I'm fucking up. And God help you if you are my friend and you fuck up because I will fucking eat you no, asshole first. Like, I, am, I, am, I, am, I am afraid of one troll on the internet. <laughs> Not... There's one. He's that's sitting Andy. across, He's sitting the desk across right now. <laughs> that's the, that's the one. Live and in person. I'm like, and that's the thing. People are like, oh, you're just blinded. I'm like, I'm not blinded. Like you guys, I mean, if well, let's use the word to use. You're telling me that I'm blinded. Could you even fucking find a mirror right now? Yeah. Well, you know, people are like, well, these are just your friends. I'm like, D and? okay. And those are the people that know me best. I, I, yeah. I mean, those are the people that know me best. Those are the people that if I was doing something wrong would get a hold of me personally and right. say, "Hey Evan, you're being a total idiot." Yeah. But which it, is which is there's a good percentage chance that I'm being an idiot. Yeah. I, a good percentage of the time. Like and, and isn't that what the press is supposed to do? Don't they go to the people closest to that person to find out what the truth of the matter is? And then the second somebody speaks well, up like, "No, no, no, back up. You're too close to ID this issue." Well, NPR, like they screwed me, right? They put out this fucking Oh yeah, news article that was like you know, man, you know, they gen, feature gen that up fast. No, no, they did, and and that's to be expected, right? Like, there's no there's no love lost from me and the left. I mean, I've been in a fight with those guys for five plus fucking years over everything. Um, you know, it's 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 just one of those things where you're just trying to talk rationally to people, you know, about what you're doing, stop about yelling, what you do. 
and you can't you can't get through. I mean, just yeah. the name alone incites so much fucking. Well, you guys are a Second Amendment company, mm-hmm. which is what that conversation mm-hmm. with my initial point degraded into. Of people saying that I had lost the forest for the trees because you guys are all two A, and I'll be the first to admit. Guess what? Black Rifle is in the name. Sure. Um, it's founded by veterans. It's a huge portion of their marketing. And my point back is, if the Second Amendment goes away, I'm pretty sure your coffee sales are going to be just fine. Well, doesn't you know, mean I you're think, not peripheral to the no. sec- the Second Amendment community, which I would totally agree with. But let's be clear about what a two A company is. In my mind, we're talking weapons and ammo manufacturer a company right. like the NRA, a single issue organization. And I mean, I'm sure I could think of more for uh, if I had more time to think about it. But those are direct two A companies. Yeah, they they serve the exact industry. Whereas you know the the genesis of my company has always been we, we don't make guns. Yeah, I make or coffee gun parts, I, I, or know, ammo. I was, I was dragging around. Like, the, the funny thing is, uh, this is this is actually make me audit. I think a lot of the the history and evolution of the company, which I think is a good thing, right? Where. You know, as a guy that was slinging around carbines for the majority of my life for a profession, that's what I did, right? It's like I went from SF and then I went to the CIA for nine years and and then I spent the last couple of years there just trying to teach people how to shoot more effectively like in, in special operations guys, not like guys that hadn't thrown around carbines. So this was in my DNA. I love, you know, I, the, part of the things that I really love is shooting really fucking fast and I love race pistols and race rifles. Like I remember back in the day, man, I was walking around Shot Show uh, before I had Black Rifle. I'd come out to look at new gear and things like that, and uh, just talking to people because back then, you know, nobody knew who the fuck I was. But there's my community; they're my people. Um, and then the next or two two years later. I was dragging around a duffel bag because I was roasting coffee like one pound at a time. <laughs> and I'd made a bunch of samples. I'd made a bunch of samples and I was like, I was still teaching pistol carbine courses, yeah. roasting coffee mm-hmm. and dragging around a duffel bag, handing out samples, trying to give this shit away to people. It's a cool reflex. Dude, like, do you want some coffee? Yeah. They, they were like, get the fuck out of here, loser. <laughs> like they, all these guys were like, get the fuck out of here, loser. Like they're like, oh yeah, coffee. Okay. Real original oh, Real original douchebag, you know, and they get the fuck out of here. And for me, I'm like, I, I, I was trying before any of this stuff just to basically have a business that combined two things that I really loved. And, you know, so we, without going into the entire genesis of obviously you guys know, but it's like linking up with Matt and Jared uh, and looking at what we were doing on the antenna entertainment side. It was like, oh, fuck, this is super funny, right? Like, this is really fucking funny. And all we were doing was just trying to make people laugh and fucking roast great coffee. That was it. <clears throat> and we were trolling other people to include like, you know, the that would they weren't really necessarily called woke people but you're we just trolling people basically and uh which was super fun i mean that that was fun still know? is still is yeah it still <laughs> fucking is you're right but you know to answer your question man like uh, to have this audit and kind of look at the genesis of this and it's like uh we turned it more into a veterans based company because it was it was one of those things where all of us were vets we saw what was happening in the community we really saw what was happening to every every one of us i mean all of us are vets so it just became more more about how do we point this thing in the direction of doing good versus just making stupid videos right so because as actually a point as it was growing we're like we got to fucking get our shit together and we got to point this thing at good and, and really <laughs> and really and really drive it forward for the, for the betterment of of our subculture and our people yeah um but it, it's interesting to me because people always say well you know you guys are a 2a company and it's like no the company's 400 people it's it's separate from me now right it, it, it it's his own thing and i'm a 2a guy i don't think you know I, i'm not here to like flash my fucking 2A credentials. I don't think I have to, but uh, it's weird for me because people are like, well, you guys are supposed to be, you know, chiming in on this. I'm like, dudes, we make, 
dick jokes on the internet like the equivalent <laughs> of it and we roast coffee like go to your fucking you know nra or some of these other organizations and then yeah. hold them accountable i was i think i was shocked the most by it by one the speed with which people developed a concrete opinion yeah like Ooh. just the rapidness Woo. of being so incredibly sure of what had happened absent really any concrete information and uh and how much they were reaching out. I that mean, and the, I got some nasty grams. Well, that and the yeah. the expectation. My dad did. Yeah. I'm like, so what yeah, in the uh, fuck is the going re- on? The rapidity with where they, I think that's a word, rapidity. The speed I, with cares? which they got yeah. to their uh, yeah. opinion, and then two, the demands that you know, like I was scrolling through your feed, and people were like answer this yeah. specific question. Yeah. And my terminology, it's like, who the fuck are you to demand that an individual? Yes, you're the founder of the organization, but when did it get to a point where if I don't use the exact words right. that you want, and then I have to scroll through more and use the exact words yeah. that somebody else, like where did that level, I mean, that's a little bit of an entitlement attitude, no, there, I would say. there's a significant amount of t- entitlement. So, you know, you've got a, you've got a portion of uh, the country that believes that if you don't do exactly what they say, they can hold you accountable through, you know, intimidation, basically. And it's like, this is my company. You know, I've heard so many false fucking bullshit in the last, like, like just the bullshit in the last week of, you know, people making videos about, you know, me and there's all these conspiracy theories and all these fuck crazy things. I'm like, <laughs> dudes, my wife makes fun of me half the time. Like, if you think I'm that sophisticated to, to do this, <laughs> like my kids are reading faster than me at this point. Or, or have enough time on yeah, your hands or to I be have, involved dude, I have, in I any have, of this I shit? I have two little kids in a company with 400 people. I don't have time to like layer in and build my entire life. Like the, the conspiracy theory shit is like mind blowing to me because throw one out there. Um, I'm a, I'm a democratic operative. I've heard this one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I've spent my entire adult life. <laughs> I might've started lying to, I, I, I just think it's, it's like, dude, I've, I'm like, I, I was telling this to somebody. I was like, I've then I've spent my entire adult life lying to everybody to include my dad and everybody else just to make a $500 donation just, just to <laughs> so be I've hired 400 people $500 went, mentoring yeah, candidate and it's like you know the we're, not, we're not one, perfect the donation one brings up an interesting point though too because why this is something I don't understand sure people who will drive their entire life philosophy based on only one issue like why it's can't a, you single issue voters right? And that's but part why of can't the you be more nuanced it's, than that? It's why crazy? Can't... I mean, oh like... well, nuance. I use that word. Mm. I use that word responding to something, and and some guy chimed in and goes, "That's a leftist word." And I'm like, "You guys are pushing us into an Orwellian <laughs> nightmare. fucking nightmare. <laughs> you can't use specific words, or you're going to identify <laughs> with the left or the right." And you're like, "Oh my god, look, this... Evan, that's newspeak. You can't yeah, use that word." See, exactly. And I'm like. I know it might be, uh, uh, it's, and I'm not, and I'm not butthurt about it. I, I'm not even like trying to be defensive because at the end of the day, it's something you can't really explain to people in 120 characters. It's something that I don't even want to attempt to explain. It's like the company is separate from Evan Hafer. Evan Hafer is the guy that you know runs the company, but there's a lot of other people that help me run the company. There's Tom Davin over there, and there's Matt Best, and there's all my other guys that are running this over here. And it's like, there's not a grand conspiracy. It's just a bunch of former mill guys roasting coffee and making stupid videos and trying to hire a bunch of vets. <laughs> like, it's not too sophisticated at the end of the day. It's really yeah. not. But anyway. I, I, it caught me off guard. That whole situation did, for sure. Oh, it caught and me And I wasn't flat-footed. on the receiving end. It caught me flat-footed. I expected something like this from the left. I did. I was like, fuck those guys. You know what I mean? I expected something from that uh, because that they're kind of notorious for just wanting to, like, you know, cancel specific businesses. Uh, I expected it. I think that was the one, like, I was like, Pfft. okay. Hey, the 2A guys, those are my, those are my homies. Like, what oh, happened? my gosh. You know, especially, like, after being part of the shooting community and the things that or just the tactical world the tactical world and i guess that's probably easier and there's what i've realized there are different layers of the community too right so there are the tactical guys 
in the professional shooting community. And then there's the tactical LARPers. You've got a ton of tactical LARPers. And I come from a specific background with this more, it's more tactical guy driven. And I've never really been exposed to people that weren't, you know, professional shooters, professional shooters. I, I, to be honest with you, like the, a lot of the stuff that, and a lot of the people that we affiliate with, they're former team guys or most SWAT of the guys, guys. Most or, of the guys in the company. Yeah. yeah it's, and it's most of the guys in the company. Like, it's like Logan's a sniper, Matt's a ranger, Jared was an Air Force guy. He doesn't really count. Yeah. Uh, Sixth branch, just underneath Space Force. Like, we have our own 100 yard range. <laughs> with like a steel garden i bought rifles for the entire company you know like I, it, it's like i've never expected that one to come i was like okay well i guess i guess you know as you're digging out and kind of uh which is like it's it's another whole thing where they're trying to dox me on certain things and they're like oh well you voted or you donated to this campaign or that campaign I'm like all right sure you guys got me okay but whatever it's unfortunately but the who gives of- a fuck what campaign you these guys to. do because they're single. Yeah. They're single. They're single issue voters. Well, it's because of this is the logical conclusion of what's been going on the last eight or nine months, which is if you don't believe in X issue, you are the enemy and you yeah. are voting for the other team. And I say team because it's turned into a sporting event. So how did we get to here? Well, I, I where think, it became that? I think I saw this. I think I saw this coming like several years ago. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure a lot of us saw some of this. Well, yeah, you're an operative. This, so. Yeah, exactly. Right? At the team meeting. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the team meeting. Uh, no, I, I could kind of see some of this happening. I think social media is definitely, it, it's, it's, it's increased it. the division in the company. It's also increased. Company or country? Or, sorry, country. It's, it's, you don't own the whole fucking I country. Wish. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> I sure don't. Um, That's phase two. Yeah, phase two. <laughs> phase two, stand by. It's like, like I'm fucking we're in Jack Dorsey me. or Jeff Bezos. It's like, fuck, man, I live in the same house I've had for I don't know how fucking long. Like, what are you guys talking about? Um, no, I think, I think it's a rapid acceleration, a gaslighting, and ultimately a group of people that are siloed and they're in their own echo chamber and they're they're spinning each other faster and faster and faster and faster. And they can't come out. They can't come out for a breath of fresh air and think, oh, well, I know my neighbor is a Democrat or a Republican, but it's my neighbor and he's pretty cool or she's pretty cool and I'm just going to hang they, out. They, they and put my cool. packages into my house when I'm gone. Yeah, like I was, yeah. At, I was, at, a, I was at a barbecue, uh, believe it or not, it was a barbecue. I wasn't wearing a fucking mask. I know. Rule breaker. Super spreader. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of people from my neighborhood were together. We had our kids together. Actually, it was Halloween because we weren't doing trick-or-treat. That's the one day you're supposed to wear a mask. Yeah. Day. Well, I know. I was wearing a you're Batman so mask. You're so contrarian. <laughs> I was wearing a like, Batman not today. mask. That goes over the wrong part. I'm going to wear the only mask that <laughs> doesn't cover today. my nose or my mouth. Uh, Batman. And my neighbors are more, you know, of the... the uh, Left-leaning. Left-leaning. But my other neighbor, he owns Alpha Munitions, <clears throat> and he's one of my best friends. I would say one of my better friends in the neighborhood. Um, and we were sitting there and we were all talking. Like we were just like shooting the shit and kind of getting a little bit political, just the way things go. And Tom and I are pseudo preppers for a lack of a better term. Like we've got all the shit. Things. And we're, and we're like, hey, you guys, when things go down, don't don't worry. You can come to our house. We'll, we'll take care of you. <laughs> like I know you guys are... I, I know you guys are, and it's and it's so funny because we were talking about it. Where I have like a collection of Nerf guns at the house because I let my daughters play with Nerf guns because I'm not a douche, and uh, nobody else at times in the neighborhood they don't have Nerf guns to play with. So all the other kids, the boys, they're like three and four years older than my daughters. They'll be in the backyard playing in my backyard, and I'm like, my daughter's upstairs. I'm like, hey, what the fuck, are you guys doing? Like, oh, we're just playing Nerf guns. I'm like, let me get mine. <laughs> oh no, Mr. Hafer's getting his gun. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but Tom and I were talking about it. We were talking about, you know, our neighbors and we all had the same interests, by the way. We want safety for our families. We want to raise our children. We want to educate them. We want 
you know, to ultimately create these incredible experiences for them. And oh, by the way, none of those guys we were talking to are anti fucking gun guys. None of them. They're like, ah, oh, we get it. It's just like, ah, oh, they're a little bit intimidating. And Tom and I are like, hey, you can go to the range. You can get some training. We, yeah. like, I know this guy, this guy, this guy. And they're like, yeah, I could see how you'd want one, especially when this fucking country is so crazy right now with, you know, defund the police narratives. And, you know, with COVID, we might not be able to respond in time. You got all this like lunacy happening. There's just a lot of people that are fucking keyed up, ready to go. But most people want the same things. Like they just kind of want to, they want to be cool with each other. They want to raise their kids. And then you have fractions that are like, fuck it, burn it all down. And you're like, Anarchy. Uh, hey man, it's pretty cool. It's a really good system. Like we, I don't think we need to reset everything just yet. It's an interesting time. There's a lot of people screaming for anarchy and burn it down and revolution that have never seen it in person. I don't know or if the there's result, a lot. Or the result I think, of. They're I think just, it's just a small, loud group of people. I think they're just loud. That's all it takes, though. But yeah, I would agree with you. Like, I don't know about you guys. The people that I know who are the most capable of violence are the ones who are looking for it the least. Yeah. Yeah. Or people who have been in places where infrastructure collapses and you're in a fourth or fifth world country that's been ruled by the stick for fucking generations. <laughs> we talked nobody's, about this in the truck. Nobody's like, hey, we should build our system like that. The people who've experienced that, I, I don't know. The defund the police thing, do we really need to have this experiment? No, I, I, I think I mean, it's it's so We're about to insane. watch what's going to happen in L.A. It's insane to me. That, what that they entire conversation oh, is they, they insane. They yanked sex trafficking, special crimes. I can't remember the, the rest of this. But they took the easiest ones to get off the table for the department. That's what they grabbed. For budgetary-wise and yeah. reallocated? Uh-huh. So, I mean, I wish good we lived, luck. I wish we lived in a, in a world where everybody would just follow the rules because they're like, oh, the rules actually help our society continue to move forward. And I wish that we lived in a place where you didn't have to have people standing on the correct side of the rules. But we don't live there. I, I go back and forth, right? I, I have this internal debate and dialogue with my with myself all the time. And, you know, because I, I think I am a libertarian at heart in the, in the essence of it, which is I think a smaller government is it gives people the the ability to have more of their individual freedom, right? And then you give people more freedom, which means they have to assume more responsibility for their actions. And that's where I start to get stuck and kind of stalled out because humans don't want to take responsibility for their I was going to say, they probably want as much freedom as you'll give them, but they're going to have a problem with the second step. They're, they're going to have a... The, and as a society, we're all going to have a problem with this because you've got one group of people that are... are and I wouldn't say one. You've got this really fucking eclectic 350 million people you've got this loud group of people that are saying more government more government more government they don't necessarily say more government they say you know we need to fund these initiatives and what they don't necessarily understand and i think people that have worked for the government such as the three of us I don't want the government to run my health care the va has been part of my fucking health care life for i don't know the last six years and then before that it was military health care i want everybody that is saying that to go try to try to get an appointment with the va let the let them experience maybe looking to the dmv to get a fucking health you know everybody hates that experiment yeah or just ask any vet you might know or encounter if they've had a weird experience uh, you know like my I, buddy got a ball taken off when he had a fucking knee injury or something. Like, it was crazy. <laughs> they took his fucking testicle. So He's far, like, everything seems relatively logical and upfront. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking maybe they fixed his knee while they were chopping his ball. I'm surprised they didn't take both of them. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, make him a unit. <laughs> they were being, hey, you, they were hey being man, efficient. this is going to help your knee. We're going to take these balls off you. You know what's hurting your knee? Testosterone. <laughs> 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 Let me go ahead and snip, snip. <laughs> yeah. You're good. Like the horror stories involved with, and sometimes people have great insane. experiences with the VA, but I would say it's not the norm. That would be the yeah. anomaly. I yes. like the idea of having people experiencing trying to get a critical medical appointment via the DMV. That yeah. would be a good. One. I, I want people to just <laughs> think of government service, and then think, okay, if the DMV ran this, 
this is what the experience would look like. If the DMV ran your grocery store. Correct. That's what I want people to think about because think about how fucked up that place is and you've got people with their pockets of authority when you have when you have, I would say, you know, government employees that know they can't get fired and they've got a position of authority with a repetition, a job of repetition, you can treat people however the fuck they want. Yeah. They can't get fired. So And there's no benefit for them to increase their work put or it, put through or you know, their workload. No. So it's like people are screaming for government run health care and it's like that's not what I want. That <laughs> we, sounds we have it. A lot of horrible. us have it. Yeah. People will uh <clears throat> I encounter the 9-11 was an inside government job often. And I, oh, first I heard off- that so many times. First off, just, I laugh very heartily yeah. because I would love for the government to try to keep that a secret, to try to set that up. Dude, and the government- I think goes, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. I mean, you worked at the agency where people think is the fucking genesis of Jason Bourne. No. He's not fucking there. He's not there. <laughs> it's, I, think the, I think the agency actually funds those movies- just to give people the perception that they're really fucking squared away. It's a bunch of Jason Bumbleheads running amok, <laughs> dude. And it's like, dude, the it, fucking government is not capable of loading those buildings with explosives. No. Secretly at fucking nighttime. No. Getting all that shit to happen and you're telling me nobody's come forward, you've obviously never worked for the government. No. It, it, <laughs> what I, I always explain this to people. I'm like, you have to think about the American intelligence apparatus as a... Uh, 18th century wooden ship. It floats, kind of works, but there's water coming in that bitch all the time. Like it is, <laughs> it does not actually work. There, there's some kid in the basement plugging holes yeah. all day. Yeah, it's like, Except dude. for maybe on the cyber side. Yeah, no, no. Damn. I think there are some, I think there's some incredible people. And, and this isn't me He didn't just say the sails this. didn't work. It's true. There are aspects of the boat it works. Or the navigational yeah, suite. They work hey like man, you got a sextant. That shit's pretty cool. That's like CAG. You know, Delta would be like the bathroom. It probably works because you can throw your <laughs> butt over the edge. I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying. Um, You're spitballing here. Yeah, I'm spitballing. I'm just throwing, <laughs> throwing ideas. <laughs> I'm just throwing <laughs> ideas. Out. See if that sticks against the wall. No. I, the I, biggest thing that I think <laughs> the government is capable of doing that people aren't paying attention to is the cyber side, the lack of security and. Uh, that got out of hand really fast. Yeah, the lack of security or just to have the ability to have information that the government is not taking a look at. That shit, I think, would absolutely surprise people. Like, I remember my thoughts on this have shifted. I remember when Snowden first came out, I was like, you right. fucking piece of shit. Yeah. And now I look back and I'm like, well, we, we watched damn, that here. We watched that here together. And both of us said the same thing. Like, yeah. holy shit. Yeah. What? And, I, you know, it if what I have watched is accurate... He did what he could to protect sources and make sure that people weren't burned. But he also burned the programs that were illegal in snooping on American citizens. It's like, you know what? I'm glad that he did that. And if it's accurate, man, did that dude try his damnedest to get somebody else to do it. Yeah. He, well, he's like, I'm at the bottom of this totem pole. Why am I trying to push it over? Like, somebody at the top should be but nobody's this but shit that's, over. But that's the thing I, I really... And I've ranted about this for years where there's no government accountability, right? The guys that were yeah. actually in charge of this, they never get fucking thrown in jail. They never ro get rolled up and put in jail. They, they never get sent to a different three-letter agency. Yeah, a different three-letter agency. I, and I think that's what people refer to as the swamp, right? It's, it's actually uh, mid and high-level bureaucrats that that's the swamp. And... You know that's what people are are up against in the when we look at the power institutions and the institutions that continue to to directly gain from that control. A lot of these people they just they really want to push their own agenda through their individual position. A great example yeah. of that is the ATF. Randomly, like a month or so ago, they just declared a, a the pistol brace. The pistol brace, just some fucking half wit bureaucrat somewhere was like, oh well. Hey, the pistol brace is now illegal. This one's now illegal. Turned them into SBRs, right? Yeah. So they made 4,000 people criminals overnight. So some guy so with a fucking stamp. let's discuss this one. Bang. Let's discuss Please. this one. I'm not saying that the ATF, I'm putting no value judgment on it. Let's talk Great. about an SBR. I'm going to talk pistol. about shit that I don't know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going saying... to make really opinionated statements. Well, here's so the thing. Just when it comes to there. the Second Amendment, right? This right. is the number one comment that I guarantee you will be in my DMs when this episode comes out. 
shall not infringe, shall yeah. not infringe. I'm like, okay, I get that. What was the design of the pistol brace? Do any of you guys know why it was created in the first place? I think originally it was to stabilize the pistol with the forearm. Correct. Which is another way of saying we're going to give you something that looks like a buttstock, but because we word it as a forearm brace instead of a buttstock, it's a pistol instead of an SBR. Which I love because you're playing the ATF's fucking stupid and again, game. Like I said, I'm putting no value judgment on it, but it goes right. like, and bump stocks is another one. Right. It was, from my understanding, introduced so people with handicaps could. It, you know, enjoy shooting. I'm like, mm -hmm. enjoy shooting with a replication of full. <laughs> like, again, no value judgment. I just wish we could have open and upfront conversations. Like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get this very short barreled rifle caliber pistol to be legal by using words to navigate around the system? If you tell me yes, I'm still going to say, okay, I'm not a lawyer, but at least we're having an honest conversation about what you're doing. No, but it, it's it's everybody, uh, I think, wanting to to kind of pretend that this isn't what's happening, right? And it's uh, I, there's no love lost for for me specifically in reference to these ridiculous fucking definitions as to what's an SBR, what isn't an SBR, what's legal and what isn't. What's a and I think semi the danger being what just happened. One day, what is legal? <laughs> it's not COVID. Yeah, okay. One day to it is legal. <clears throat> yeah, illegal. Next. Well, In for instance, a short barrel rifle, right? Like at some point, there were people who just wanted a short rifle because they wanted a short rifle, and then some bureaucrat decided that's this... really dangerous. That needs a tax stamp. You, you're going to be a felon if you own one now. And they just they gave it an arbitrary length, like it's X. Now it's a short barrel rifle. Like, okay, but it's in that, and that's I think that that's the what thing. The fuck is, is going this on? is all what what people are are. What people want to discuss is why, like what, what fucking planet did you? Why did you decide fly in that? from and just decide this is the, this is what constitutes short or this yeah, is that's what, what I'm interested like, in. Yeah, where are you making this decision? Like, like the, be, like, be like honest the, with me about why you wrote this law. Right. Be honest with me about why you created this piece of equipment, which, on the outside, really looks like you're trying to skirt this law. And if you're just honest with me about that, I'd have a better understanding and appreciation. Like, can we just put the cards on the fucking table I mean, and have a conversation? No, because it's the government. Because <laughs> it's the government. It doesn't fucking make sense. That's why I keep, that's what I've been arguing about. I'm like, dudes, we don't need more people not making sense yeah. involved in our lives. Like, we see it. We see it every day that we've been in this COVID fucking mess. With these morons, like, oh, we got to fucking, like, we, we just experienced it. You got to wear your mask in the restaurant as you're walking to your table, but then you can take your mask off. So I'll describe this. We went to a restaurant in town. We walked to the table. I was standing at the chair I was going to sit in, and a woman walked up to our table and said, you need to have a mask on to come in here. Probably yes. nine feet. Nine feet. It was nine feet. And to be clear, I did not have a mask on me. I'm not fucking making a value judgment on masks or not. What I'm talking right. about is thought process. I'm sitting at the chair that I'm going to sit down in. And I said, if I sit down, do I still need a mask? And she said, yes, you need a mask to come in here, but I'm already in here <laughs> standing at the seat. And then you gave me an extra mask. We sat down and we moved on. And I made the comment to you, like there's some leaps in logic here. And again, I'm not trying to say that I was no. correct in what I did. What I'm trying to say is like, it's okay if I just sit like that makes everything okay. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? Like, there's, we need to either be serious or not. Or like the story you were telling about the man who literally had a lace mask. No, he was he had a knitted mask. You could see his fucking mouth <laughs> from <laughs> behind it. And yeah. this dude's walking through the airport, and then we all have to like pretend that this is a real mask that's doing yeah. something, and we're all just expected to go in with this thing. And Wait, go, you mean like, the well, hey, don't question anything. Evan, I, like think the, the, I think I like think the, the shields. I think the woman today wanted me to walk back out, put a mask I, on, and walk no, back I in. I know, I know, she did. Which that's defeats. What she it, that's what I'm saying. Like I don't, I, I don't get it. And I don't know if you guys caught this. What she said was, "We have to comply, or we're going to get shut down." And then the health, I caught and then that. the health inspector came in. Correct. With the mask under his, his nose. Yep. Correct. With a clipboard, and, and that's what I'm telling you guys. Obese. Number <laughs> like, one 
risk factor associated so far with COVID fatality. Yeah. Obesity. Well, you can't say that. You can't oh, say that. Right? I'm sorry. He was a fat fuck. <laughs> I'll say it. He was obese. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like in our society that nobody want, wants to have an open and honest conversation about the real risk. So then we all have to pretend. And there's that, these fucking that, logical gaps. Huge. Well, and you're being, you're being told that if you are, are publicly talking about comorbidity factors, that you are either denying that this is dangerous or that you're shaming those people. Yeah. Okay. Um, neither one of those things are true. If you feel ashamed for having one of those factors that is preventable, and I'm talking about things like obesity, not some other comorbidity that is genetic, that's your fault. So if you feel ashamed, that's not. I'm not trying to make you feel ashamed. I don't want somebody to feel bad about themselves. I want them to fix themselves. Yeah. But we need to be talking about factors that are actually affecting people. Well, and I don't walk around looking for reasons to insult people, but if somebody that's gets- not true. That's, I don't often true. walk around looking for reasons <laughs> to <laughs> insult people. But the thing is, to go to your point, like if if you're if you feel insulted by if yeah, it's it's like again, there's this gap in logic. Can we just be honest with each other? Like uh, apparently not. You're seventy pounds overweight, not because of something that I did. Am I an asshole if I make a joke about you? Yes, I certainly am. But the issue is also that you could eat your way out of that or through discipline or, you know what I mean? Like, it, can we just fucking be honest? The person who, in the grander scheme of things, whether it be a long-term burden to the healthcare system, an economic burden to the United States, like, it's not me making a joke about a guy 70 pounds overweight. It's the dude who's 70 pounds overweight. And and I can speak to But this. I'm the asshole if I say anything? No, no. How did we get here? Yeah. I, there are three people that have been that have been around in the last 10 months that have all lost over 50 pounds because they identified it in the spring and they're like, oh, that seems like that's going to be a problem if I catch this. And they probably made it their primary focus and, and you shipped know what? away at it. They all feel better. They're eating better. They are healthier. And they all lost more than 50 pounds. And they can probably see their dick now. Yep. You're well, making a gender assumption, but yes, that's, that's okay. I apologize to any of those three people if they were not. <laughs> They've worked their fucking asses off, like, like actually. Yeah. But that's what it takes. Yes. But how did it get to the point where the person who says the obvious in that particular situation is the problem, not the person who eats themselves into that situation? To use that as an example. How the fuck did that get flipped on its head? Well, I think there's there's a certain section of, of America that believes that uh, any negative speak towards anyone else is you you can't do that that's not permitted right how much but positive then, reinforcement did you get in the green beret pipeline none a, a negative <laughs> a negative trevor like, I how much positive reinforcement was used in the seal pipeline from you none <laughs> in general but here's the thing so here's the thing though do you no, feel I, like I, and no. i'm not saying i it's did I, I was like hey good job dummy yeah. Run that hill again, you know, or something like that. It was and, like, and here's the thing. There's a time and place for that type of pipeline and, and uh, reinforcement. But don't you guys feel like you're probably a little bit more resilient between the ears because you learned how to deal with that as opposed to being a bubble walking around in any small pinprick just explodes everything that you are? Yeah, I, I, I think this is one of the, the, the biggest things that I keep coming back to, especially with my kids it's like you have to teach them resiliency and you have to start my daughter for instance my my wife doesn't necessarily agree with this but uh my daughter when she's six and she starts getting a little bit like she rolled her eyes at me the other day that cost her waterboarding some, that no that cost her some air squats like she's <laughs> like i'm just sitting there in the chair going down up down up down up and hey hold your hands out straight and my wife is like oh dude and i'm like no it's it's a squat. At the yeah. end of the day, this isn't going to go on for an hour. It's not going to go on for an hour. It's twenty air squats. I mean, it could depending on what the little try. bastard yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> but, Start with the roll your eyes. That's going to be about sixty seconds. You still daddy's truck. We're going to yeah. be out here for a little bit. <laughs> but it's teaching resiliency today, and it's not an online curriculum, as I guess is how I would encapsulate that. No, it's not an online. It's not an online curriculum. And the other piece is is. It, what, when we were growing up, there was that that saying, right? Sticks and stones break your bones, but you know, words, name calling words or, will never hurt you. you. Words will never hurt you. And I think that's one of the things that is lost today, which is everybody thinks that these words are going to hurt you, and they're 
they go into microaggressions and a lot of these other things. And it's like, dude, I've been called a beta cuck probably 5,000 times in the last week week you're welcome most uh, of those are for no me. problem <laughs> i had to look it up I was Andy, like, what does accounts. this what does this actually mean <laughs> oh man um <laughs> i used a uh, cuckold not too long ago in a tactical asshole post which by the way was taken down by instagram wow that post was hilarious however i had some people at instagram who were fans of the page internal review we're back in business well <laughs> it's it's become a joke around Zing. the house <laughs> It's, it's become a joke around my house. Like my wife will be like, don't bend the knee to me or whatever. Right. She'll come in and it's like, you beta cuck. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to look it up to make sure I was applying it to Steven Seagal correctly. I, I think you probably did. I, 100%. Any Steven Seagal and beta cuck. I think they kind of go hand I went in with glove. Cuck holder. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's about right. <laughs> my wife, my wife is like fucking, you know, God bless her. She's she's fucking pretty funny. Let's dude. be honest. Anybody who can tolerate either any of us, any of us, like is a At fucking all? walking saint. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She's yep. she's uh, she's been pretty funny because like at, at at the height of whatever it was, she like called me a fucking like she came in. She's like, "Don't bend the knee," or <laughs> "I'm not gonna bend the knee." And I'm like, Jill, "Okay, yeah." I need it's five like, minutes to go look this up. I tell you what, I will say to go to your point of the sticks and stones will break my bones, but worlds will never hurt me. There is, and I see this in my own kids, there's a difference between recognizing that words have real world impact, which right. they absolutely do, especially on people who I think are in their formative years. Right. Uh, my daughter's 12 and she will react um, appropriately. So, I mean, there was a stretch where she went through some, I would say, legitimate cyberbullying, people telling her to kill herself online. Wow. There's real world impact in that. Yeah. But there's also levels of interaction online that don't have to be taken with the same level of severity as somebody saying that far end of the spectrum. And it has to be, well, I mean, again, it goes back to the term we're not allowed to use, nuance. Right. And understanding that just because, hey, somebody's like, you're stupid on a post, like, ignore that. You don't have to react to that with the same velocity and volume of somebody saying, hey, you should kill yourself. But people make, people make you know? assumptions that you have to respond to them or you have to give them exactly what they want, right? Like, I had somebody post about, about Black Rifle on my page. Right. I deleted the comment and then yeah. ceased all commenting on the thread. And then they well, commented three, on another post. They're like, why'd you delete my comment? I'm like, look, man, this isn't a forum for your fucking opinion. Yeah. Well, you're also 3x the age of my daughter, right? So you have the ability to do yeah. that. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want my daughter to think that people don't exist, or, you know, that nobody exists that's going to talk to her in that right. way. There's a balance yeah, yeah. that you have to find, and it, I don't know how it's, I mean. I'm, I'm trying really hard to, and I and we don't really, we limit electronic devices, like, really early, you know, they can only watch so many hours of TV, which sounds like we're, you know, limiting this, but, you know, we are, uh, because we're, we want the kids to engage with each other, right? They're three and six. We it will be tougher to for you as they get older, level up. And here's what I think: it got a little bit out of hand with my kids early on, right? Which, um, for anybody listening, once that h horse is out of the barn, good luck putting it back. Yeah. And I think the what I allowed to change my opinion was kind of the constant narrative of, well, all of my friends. <clears throat> You know that all of my friends, and it's like, well, if, if I don't, I don't, if I can't communicate with them, you're restricting me from my social circle. You know, that's not the exact words they use, right. but that was the sentiment. It's like, okay, fuck, I don't want to do that. But then the next thing you know, the entire their entire world is just right there, a four boom, inch boom, boom, by boom, two boom. inch screen. <laughs> and I think, it, I think that this is so. It's so good in so many different ways, right? Well, but it allows so me to send toxic. you inappropriate pictures at yes. any time I want, which which I. I really enjoy uh, the post I sent you the other day it was spectacular <laughs> was yeah. was amazing but I, what I'm trying to do I think in kind of my whole angle on this is I, I need to teach the kids as they grow up that this isn't real this isn't real human connection this isn't real this is an electronic device that ultimately allows you to communicate but what's happening inside of social media is not necessarily real uh, I don't know how that's going to play out because I've got a few more years before I really have to try to unpack that and organize it and try to. Elon's going to have it. the chips ready for your head before yeah. you get to that point. Which, you know, can't wait for that. <laughs> you know, like we could just, Fuck. just fucking fast forward to this or Orwellian nightmare right now. That's what I you mean, need a phone that you can never turn off in your fucking head. That's forever. what we all need. Well, I mean, looking back <clears throat> in the time machine, how do you think 
it would have been for you growing up if we had these fucking devices. Oh I would have been on pornography God. 24 hours It would have been a shit show. I, I would have literally, like, there's no doubt in my mind. You would have had really I, bad I, the tendonitis. First, the first time. And typing shit in there that you didn't yes. really mean because, yeah. like, oh, it's just a digital. It's, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I look back. That guy. Do you know how lucky I am? Yes. Let's just talk about me for a second. Yeah, you guys know me you. pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any idea how fucking lucky I am? There's not a written record of the things that I thought at that age. Oh God, we well, wouldn't we be sitting. Or, this, or we would said. not be sitting at this table. I can tell you that much. No, no, I, <laughs> I don't think any of us would would it's be like, here. I, I, no. I, we are so fortunate. Oh, that, like my first cell phone was uh, 1996. That was when I when I first got my I, 1996 1997 maybe probably was like 50 bucks a month for 30 minutes something like that but it was all you know it's a flip phone like a Sprint flip phone with a pull out antenna I still have it and I'll <laughs> so I'll take it out every now and again and like the battery it, lasted a week I'll take it out every now and again my wife's like what are you doing with that I'm like I'm just gonna make some posts with this thing you know <laughs> take some snaps make some posts whatever it's with your thing. half megapixel camera yeah exactly <laughs> exactly it's got an antenna that you pull out That's what I used to, remember, I used to like, pull it with my teeth yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm going to business now. You know what I mean? Hey, I need you to buy. <laughs> it had one app, Snake. Yeah. I, I mean, fuck. Yep. Do you guys remember monitoring how many minutes were left on your plan oh, per month? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I remember talking to my mom, like, Mom, I've got to go. I've got seven fucking minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Call remember, me back in 10 minutes. It's after seven. I got unlimited after that. That's right. There was. <laughs> yeah. I remember <laughs> this when texting first came out. Yeah, and you had to and I was like, push the key. Yeah, yeah, you had to did push did the key. I was like, this is the dumbest <laughs> shit. Why wouldn't I just call somebody? Because this, this will is never so catch dumb. on. Yeah, this exactly. Like, but people, this people had not been texting enough, so we were still doing full words, full full, full sentences the entire time. There was no like, hey, no, yeah, you like none of the shit that's going on now, and you have a full keyboard sitting right in front of you. <laughs> yeah. I have to at least once a week. I'll text my daughter. I'm like, what did you just say? <laughs> yeah. It's like T-T-D-L-R-L-O-L. I'm just like, what? And then, and then, then a string of emojis. She's like, dad. I'm like, I don't know this shit. And it, actually, because I'm embarrassed to ask her, half the time I'll just throw it into Google. And it yeah. comes up. I'm like, oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Talk to you later, dad. Have a good night. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Trying to figure out what people are saying. I, I think that's the other thing is like throwing somebody, not not as if like, I'm ancient, but it's like throwing myself into the electronic world and trying to figure out things that are like happening and what people are talking about. It's like, there's so much shit to keep up with. Most of the time, all I'm doing is I'm just like either talking to people on the phone or I'm texting them uh, about work, like 99% of my communications all about work. So, and everybody in, at work for the most part is still like, we're full sentence guys, right? We're like full sentence because there's a lot of things that can be- uh, Misconstrued. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, and if it can be, you have to pick up the phone and call somebody and go, hey dude, I texted this out and it sounded really fucked up. So no I'm calling tasks, you. Yeah, there's right? no implied, like don't, yeah. don't imply anything. There's no tonality to this. It's just dead. That's a tough one to not apply tone to a text. Well, and yeah. I'm glad that you've said it at the office- to more people than I can count, like there are no implied tasks. If I tell you something, just do the thing. Yeah. Not expecting more. Don't that, read anything into like it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like the the implied task thing is one of the things that we fight like all the time. And I'm like, you can't leave one step out. So over the past five years, it's like, these are the steps you need to accomplish this task. Don't leave any step out. Don't do anything outside of that. I don't need you to color outside of the lines on this one. Just yeah. fucking do it. I'm like, oh, okay. Why are you? Why are you so anal about this? I'm like, because I've learned that if, if I you've give seen you, one dumpster on fire, you've yeah, seen them all. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So who would have thought? Who would have thought the military would have taught me a few things where it's like, and I remember this so well, like you know, dummy courting everything down. There's yeah. no implied task. Don't run outside of your script to do exactly what I say. Well, think about the mission planning process. Right? All They're your like shit's Specified labeled. implied tasks. It's like, fuck. Yeah. And it's Listing everything out in crystal clear detail. So a fuckwit who's 18 yeah. with a rifle, oh, under leadership and supervision, by the way, which is another off-ramp of a current situation that are not even remotely connected, um, trained, equipped, under supervision and leadership at all times. Yeah, so those people know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, so they don't fucking shoot their buddies in the back of their head. Like, that's yep. the way it works. Or, or and, take a nap. Yeah, or take a nap. 
or forget a you know a belt fed weapon system and a patrol base as you move out or whatever it was is. Was that supposed to bring that back? Hey, oh shit, I didn't realize that. Oh, you mean I couldn't take all the rounds out of my ruck to make it lighter? Oh, dang, dude, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I needed like, water what? on this one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how many patrols I've been on in the <laughs> desert in a training environment where I just threw ammunition to the nearest crevasse that I could find. God, I remember like just kind of like, cause you'd go through, you know, your training iterations, you'd go through like an ambush or react contact, whatever it might be. And you'd see everybody around you when the fucking, <laughs> when, when the instructor had like walked away, everybody's like digging a hole and throwing <laughs> stuff in there. Like, Oh man, we got to lighten my rock by about three pounds on this one. Or you know, like, as soon as the 60 gunner in the early days or the 240 kicks off, people are just running running by throwing <laughs> ammo at them absent being asked for the dude's still got a full loadout and like fucking four boxes around him it's like the guy has 800 thanks, rounds guys. on him and you gave him 800 <laughs> rounds yeah. I, my theory is as soon as you hear that first burst just throw your box i remember out. having those conversations too like i remember having those conversations where you're on the 60 and it's like do not call shift fire until i get through this entire belt <laughs> Don't fucking say it, man. Like, I got to dump these rounds. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to change to another 100-round belt <laughs> yeah. before we have to fucking move. That was the standard was a box per guy minimum. Oh, yeah. 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 And I think the 60 gunners probably had five, probably 100 in the gun and probably four one to plus 500 four. on them. Yeah, I think yeah. it's like one plus four. And for people listening, sorry, you don't carry it like John Rambo. No, you sure don't. Yeah. <laughs> no. And that shit is heavy. God. Like... My buddy and I, uh, we were talking about this a couple months ago because we went through, um, which was phase one back in the day, which is all patrolling. And we were talking about just like, I had I had hurt my shoulder, so I couldn't put my hand above my head, and it was like it was it was an inconvenience, you know, it was a minor, tad inconvenience. Minor. But that strap, that fucking strap from the sixty, you mean the, the one G40, the one inch webbing, it would, the one it was just. <laughs> It was a torture device. It was a garrote wire. It, it was so <laughs> fucked up, and your neck was rubbed completely raw. You're yeah. in so much fucking pain with every step you're taking through the woods as you're going up and in and out of draws and everything. You're like, please, God, just let me get to the release point. <laughs> please, God. <laughs> I feel like there's two things like that. It's that and a, and a Draeger. God, a Draeger is a different type of suck. Why? Why, it just why is that a different type of It drags stuff? on your neck forward. It okay, doesn't so, chafe you as okay, much, but it so just it has, pulls it has your four head. attachment so explain, points. Explain to but everybody. One is just a half inch piece of one inch piece of webbing that goes around your neck. So explain to everybody what the dragger is, so because the LARF. Well, you're the goddamn yeah. mini submarine fucking expert. It's I a, avoid the water at all costs. It's, an, it's a Puro two closed circuit breathing apparatus. It weighs too much and it hangs around your neck. Correct. It so no closed circuit means no bubbles. It means neck. you could be sneaky if you wanted to. Yeah. So no bubbles. And like there, literally zero. There was a number of occasions. Unless you that, have, uh, because you're it. trying to breathe down your O2 <laughs> cylinder. Got it. Because yeah. they so, have they have you on an exhaustion dive, meaning you can't come up until you're empty and you're empty and you're just sitting there just like <laughs> <laughs> just blowing it out. <laughs> in out, in out. Oh yeah, I've seen those. <laughs> breathe the cylinder down. You're like, really? I can't come up until my tank's empty. But, uh, I just lost my tank. Oh. But the, I mean, uh, <laughs> for there was a, a number of times, including one where you had us running back to uh, back to buds with those hanging. I made you guys us. run back to buds. Oh yeah, we got. God, to I got in so much fucking trouble for the things Ooh. I did to students. Okay, okay. So you wear this thing around your neck. It weighs. Right. I don't know. Somebody's gonna look it up, and I have no fucking clue. It felt like it weighed forty five pounds, but probably weighed closer. A lot of five. No way. Twenty five or thirty. I'd say yeah, twenty twenty to twenty five. Anyways, so you have that. Your dive weights. Your fins. You're wearing a wetsuit. You just finished a couple hour dive, and then the staff are like, "You motherfuckers are late. You're running back to base," and it was like two miles or more. You're welcome. Yeah, and we you're had all the buoys, now. all the buoys, um, and they're like, "Yeah, you're on a fucking time limit, morons. You have four minutes and thirty seconds to be." <laughs> it back was to one base. of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's two miles. Yeah, and if you don't put out, we're gonna beat you along the way. One of my favorite fucking memories was this dude that we had. I, f I wish I could remember his fucking name, but I can't. But uh, he would always give us these time hacks that were like, you have four minutes and 33 seconds. And it was always like, it was an odd. Of course. It was always an odd number of seconds. It was One never... minute and seven seconds remaining. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was like so fucking funny. Now that you look back on it, you're like, God, this is fucking hilarious. And and I bet it went something like this. Yeah, you have one minute and 17 seconds. Go whenever you want. Mm -hmm. We're already going. I was uh, 
as a second phase instructor, I'd had, I forget what the class did to upset me, but it was definitely deserved. Of course. I right. had them uh, don their twin 80 scuba tanks with weight belt, dive masks, flipper around each hand. We went out to the surf zone, fill up the mask with water, and then we did wind sprints up oh, the burn. Fuck. <laughs> okay, okay, Andy. So I, re- I remember this because I watched it. So we go back to the second phase grinder, and the OIC is like, hey, man. Come in my office for a second. I was like, all right. <clears throat> He's like, hey, did you just uh, completely jock up all the students in their twin 80s and have them go do wind sprints directly in front of the view of the CEO's office? <laughs> His window. I was like, yeah. He's like, you're in a lot of trouble. You can't do that. I was like, well, nobody told me. So <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was like, okay, what time does this CEO usually go home? Oh, 1600? All right, got we'll it. be doing these at 1700. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got, I got, uh, I had to sign a counseling shit on that one. That was uh, terrifying to watch because I was in walk week or what we were doing at the end of first phase. Oh, yeah. You guys, that's what was loading up for we you We were guys. watching you yeah. do this to the class and we're like, oh, my God, we're so fucked. <laughs> Dude, wind sprints with twin 80s on a soft sand berm that's at least 30 feet that up. That makes me wait, want wait, to throw up wait, right now. Evan, that dive, mask, Evan. dive mask full of seawater. Wearing, oh, wearing, <laughs> wearing UDTs, dive booties, and T-shirts. Oh, Correct. Fuck. Yeah, Correct. That, it's fantastic. It got the point across. Yeah. What was the word? No, you know what? I Jock up. Yeah. So every time the class messed up in second phase, right? We had a cut, a magnetic cutout that said "Jock up," and fucking God help you if you spelled the whole thing out. And that's actually what happened with that class. Yeah. They spelled it. They'd I be think like, they, I think they almost mu- spelled it twice. Yeah, like late for muster J. Right. Like you'll get a little bit of got remediation yeah, at this yeah. point, but we'll. To save this one up special put a bow on this gift <laughs> yeah those i remember that class those fuckers got to jock up and the osc was like all right they're yours and then i got back and he was just like what the fuck are you doing I'm i like, remember you said i could go out there and remediate them. well and then they almost did it again yeah there and were some classes that were shit that, that was a moment where so i had pneumonia and failed an evolution after hell week and i got rolled back that was my class and that was one of those moments where i'm like oh that's good <laughs> it's not me but i don't want to be there this is scary. Yeah. They earned it. Well, they, oh yeah. They remember you. Like, that's I don't the know. Thing. They remember <laughs> you. Because you I'm, remember I'm those not guys. Not for probably anything good. Even though I have had great experiences with people I put through train, mm-hmm. they're like, hey, um, just so you know, I hated you for the last decade, right. but we're good. Yeah. I ran into a guy in Baghdad um, in 2005. He was a uh, phase one instructor. <laughs> in, uh, it's like, man, I fucking hated you. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the story, is is awesome because like there was part fear and part hate in there because we could never wear a rain gear right so we're just like doing <laughs> which is stupid. but you have, have to, to have it, it on you yeah we have to pack it and look but all touch. of our rain gear is in our fucking backpacks but we can't wear it on patrol so the rain it's like rain sleet a little bit of snow and you're just kind of like moving through this evolution you're slowly you're dying. Just walking and fucking freezing to death right basically at that time and he's just like walking like nothing's happening. And this dude, he's so stoic and <laughs> he's drenched to the bone and he's not Mustache? wearing- Mustache? He's not, oh, fuck yeah. Qu- fuck like, yes. Like a three-sided yes. dick broom? Dude. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> and he's just stoic. No, all of us are jackhammering. Our teeth are, are chattering so hard, as you guys know the feeling, that you can't really talk and your my hands didn't work. Yeah. So I had to put my hand in like this in the trigger well to do this- <laughs> Pull my finger back, back and forth because <laughs> my hands didn't work. And uh, I remember looking at this dude. It's like, that is a bad motherfucker, man. And God, I hate this dude. So I talked to him a couple years later, a few years later in Baghdad. I was like, bro, you are a hard motherfucker. And he's like, oh, dude, I had a three mil wetsuit underneath that. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, motherfucker. <laughs> I was like, tricks of the trade. Oh. Man, what a relief! Because I was like, "How did this, you do it?" <laughs> yeah, this dude is so hard. He's like, "Oh, I remember that. That was brutal for you guys." I was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna have to call in the ambulance for some of you guys." <laughs> so you learned resilience. Yeah, exactly. But you got to fucking move through. I mean, we dropped. <laughs> I don't know how many dudes that that first night. I don't know. They were just like, ah, I, "I'm all good. I'm good. I'm gonna go." You know, because he started a fire just off away from everybody. And just like, close enough hey, to see man, you. if you want to quit, this fire is nice and warm and toasty. As you he's standing next to it, there. steam is just rolling <laughs> off his shoulders. That's a classic Hell Week those are, those are the things I remember about 
that whole process, the mo- the first like month and a half, the most, is the staff a sta- standing there with a cup of coffee that you can see steam oh, coming yeah. out, and you're in the surf zone or doing bear crawls with your face in the sand. Somebody quits, and they're like, "Oh, here's a cup of coffee." Mm-hmm. As you're standing next to this person who oh. just quit, and you're going, "Oh fuck, is this really happening?" Oh, uh, dude, we- in my class, we lost, oh. I'd say, thirty people within the first few hours of Hell Week. It was fucking crazy. <clears throat> But classic, like, mind fuck games like that, too. Yeah. So the fire, I think, is, like, Wednesday night of Hell Week. And everybody comes up, and they have to tell a story. But it's, like... Oh, God, I it's remember a that. goddamn bonfire. And these, you, you watch dig, these... You dig trenches. Yeah, you dig trenches, of course, because you have to secure the bonfire with paddles, because that's an optimal trenching <laughs> right. tool. of course. And each student comes up, and they tell a story. And if the instructors laugh, you can go stand near the fire. And if not, you go hit the surf and stand away from the fire in the shadows. <laughs> that's solid. But you watch these kids who've been awake for like 72 hours and their skin is basically blistering because they're like, fire. <laughs> Just like inching close. Like, get away from the fire. <laughs> no sense of, uh, you know, security for themselves or like just complete disregard for their own safety. But those are the the classic ones. Like, here's your choice. You can go lay in the surf for an hour or you can come stand by the fire with me. It's a hell of a motivator. No it one. is. Well, it's pretty disheartening when you don't get a laugh right then you're okay like, go hit the surf zone oh crap oh. or another good one was we're gonna be out here all night until somebody quits yeah to those try are to, the best just try to lever just one person out and then yeah. when one person goes it's like you know what we're gonna keep going one more <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like a trick you learn early on you're like oh, this is never gonna be enough correct it's somebody will quit enough it will not be me but this isn't gonna stop yeah yeah, it's never going to stop. I remember so acutely those times where you're like, man, I just, I got, I got one more in me. I got one more step. I got one more thing. And it's like, just one more, one more, one more. And I think when you look back on that and you, you have that experience in your life, I think that's the, like one of the many things I've pulled away from experience, uh, especially going through like, you know, selection or any of those courses, when you have that when they've somebody has pushed you so fucking far that your mind is just literally looking for one more step psychologically or one more and people thing. need to understand when you say that that's actually what you mean that's not a metaphorical yeah. hey hey let's just focus it's like literally in your head i think i can actually only do one more step one more <laughs> yeah. and then one more and yeah. so you're playing that game with yourself as well you just continue to put one more one more on the fucking table and then you're like oh i feel a little bit better you know somebody will do something like uh i've talked about this a lot i think you and i talked about it the vampire effect when somebody quits it's like mm, i'll take your energy now that's my energy <laughs> the podcast i recorded earlier today steve was asking questions about buds and i was talking about the bell and how when people would ring it a small portion of their soul becomes yours and he was just like well, that's a dark way to think about it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's especially when it's people that were like star athletes in the class. So that's like, what he and I talked about You're a star about performer too. and e- bye-bye. Yeah. I mean, the first dude who quit in my buds class was in uh, the best swimmer bailed on a run. Shocker, because he was fucking collegiate level swimmer. Right. Not a lot of time running, so therefore not a lot of struggling on things other than a liquid environment. Mm-hmm. Best runner. Guess where he went? Swim. Swim. Uh, they, of course, is he's like, who really gives a shit? But you'd watch guys like D1, D2 athletes ejecting all the time. Left and right. Like they're studs, oh, but yeah. not between the years. I think that happened quite a bit when we, like, I when I first arrived, and I remember watching guys and they were like doing a thousand push ups and they're like fucking jacked. And you're like, oh man, that guy, he's, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to make it. And it's like, 15 minutes into the iteration it's like i'm out where'd push-up guy go <laughs> yeah where'd push-up guy go <laughs> oh he's going somewhere else he's going to the line that's where he's going you and know? you never see here that person again no and i think that there's there's something to be said about never being good at anything so you're like oh fuck it i can endure i'm kind of a well know. if you're never good at anything what does that mean that means you're struggling at everything yeah. and through that struggle you're probably growing and developing some resilience and if I quit, then it means that I'm not good at anything. Like that's like literally you're hanging on your door. Yeah. If I quit, like for me, it was always 
quitting was never really an option. It's, it's interesting because people have asked me that and they're like, well, you it's know, a common one for bugs too. It was never an option. It's like my body had to physically quit. They, they, it couldn't, if, if I couldn't take another step or I couldn't do something physically, couldn't do something that was the only way that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, or a, you know, a nutrition through, uh, an instructor saying, Hey, you failed this iteration, you're gone. Right. So if I eliminate that option to quit, then it's just, you just have to do it and finish it. That's it's it. It's just a game. It makes it, makes it easier yep. psychologically for for yourself. But if you take that off the table, people are like, well, how do you take that off the table? I'm like, uh, I don't know. You just take it off the table. You don't quit. That's I the way you totally do it. I totally understand what you're saying, and I don't know necessarily how to teach people that other than no. like incremental exposure over time. But then the question is, how did, like, I mean, I was 18 when I went through Blitz. Right. I don't know where I got that incremental exposure. I think people are probably different out of the box. Yeah. Well, your dad was in the Navy, wasn't he? He was. And I mean, I worked for him in a, as a masonry hod carrier for shit, everything, ever since I was very, very young. Um, not the easiest job in the world. And I actually look back. I remember, you know, one of the biggest things I tell people is if you can keep your world small, it's amazing what you can accomplish by the one step at a time. And I remember being early and I might not even have been a teenager, but I basically moved bricks in concrete for my dad for ever yeah. while I worked for him. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't a bricklayer at all. I was at best a hod carry and probably an unlicensed one at that, but the pallets of bricks would show up and they're fucking 500 bricks per pallet. Right. And I remember cutting off the, you know, getting the tin snips and cutting off the, uh, the metal that held it. And then the tongs that you could carry were six at a time. And when I first started working with him, it was two hands on one six tong thing of bricks. And then right. eventually became, you know, 12 at a time. And that mental game you play with yourself when you wake, you know, you go, you wake up in the morning, you go to the job site, and there's like six pallet of bricks. Right. And his whole thing is like, yeah, get those on the roof. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> six or twelve at a time, you know. And it's like you can, you have two ways to look at that. I have now six on the roof and four hundred ninety four more to go, or <laughs> I'm just going to do this trip and then the next one and then the next, next one, one and the next one and completely fucking ignore how many I have left because the next thing you know, sometime you'll come back and you're like, oh, that pallet's done, and then on to the next. So I learned that lesson, but it was not structured. Like my dad did not tell me that. Right. Um, but it helped for sure. Because any selection program, like you said, if you take quitting off off the table for yourself, everybody needs to remember this. Every selection program, at some, it has a stopwatch of some kind, yeah. usually in the term of months. So if you're going to play a game with a time limit and you don't quit, guess what happens? You win. You get to the end of it. You win. Yeah. Well, I, I learned that too. So, you know, my dad was a logger. He worked in the woods most of his life. So did my grandfather and everybody before him. So we spent a lot of time throughout the year gathering uh, in the summer, specifically getting firewood. So I remember that exact experience with cords of wood, just carrying. Oh God, that's another perfect one. Just carrying wood from the time that I could put wood in my hands. It was like my job to go to the shop and bring wood in for the fire for the for the fireplace it was my job to move the wood from you know this side to this side <laughs> unpack it like this this is my job right yeah. so and it's cords and cords of wood over multiple days and iterations throughout the summer where it's just like from the time that i could fucking carry wood and then it was like oh you're gonna split wood now and then you're gonna do this and looking back on it the 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 funny thing is I now have a really fond memory of those things, whereas like, I fucking hated it when I was a kid. But, dude, if you were like, hey, let's go get some wood this summer, I'd be like, fuck yeah, man, let's go. It's yeah. going to be like a hobby. Like, we'll get chainsaws out, get the splitting malls. Let's fucking do this. This is going to be super fun. I ordered a couple cords of wood last summer or two summers ago and had it dropped off at the office just so I could split wood in the back. <laughs> People were like... What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, it's a good workout, and uh, you know, it, my my grandfather on it's my dad's side. It's kind of fun. There's actually, a little bit of violence involved. Yeah, and it and it's it's a good workout. You get fucking incredible. Like if you're really working that thing, especially with a good splitting ball, dude, you're gonna you are going to sweat your fucking ass yeah, off. Yeah, pop the shirt off, light coat of olive oil on there. My grandfather died. Mir mirrored aviators. My grandfather died splitting wood. He did. Yeah, he had a heart attack at a uh, at a. Uh, heart attack and died literally splitting wood that's how he how he died so Fuck. it's like kind of a connection i think too like my family worked in the woods uh so it's always kind of a this like connection to my family and where i came from i guess 
but that was a very similar experience because I remember so well, like the the slivers that I would get in my forearms <laughs> from the fucking wood from packing it, you know, in my <laughs> my arms, and just like picking the red pieces of wood, you know, out of your fucking forearms. You're like moving wood back and forth. It's like my life is the worst. <laughs> no, it's it was uh it was fun. Now that I look back on it, but half the shit you do that's like super hard that you fucking hate when you're doing it yeah give it some time fondest memories i have yeah or almost all involve pain of some kind yeah they're like oh shit i did that that's fucking brutal i lived in a fucking snow cave on rainier one year with a group of guys a bunch of sf guys we were going to try to go summit we skied up this fucking mountain and then we just got snowed in we're just like sitting in this fucking snow cave for like three or four days you know melting snow cooking waiting for a window to go up and that was that's what we did and i was like it sucked. You were cold, wet, and miserable the entire time. But I look back and I was like, oh man, those guys were super fun. It was like yep. really funny and it sucked, but it was fun. And even now when somebody calls me from, you know, that time frame, they're like, hey dude, you remember that time we like sat in that snow cave for like three days? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You remember how shitty that was? Yeah. It's like, hey, we should go back to Rainier one day. Yeah, have you ever days. thought about <laughs> going again? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds fucking awesome, man. I wonder what those, if you could force everybody to go through a pipeline like that, I think it would drastically change the they used to. woke culture. Now there's too many of us. Well, I, I, I've thought a lot about that because uh, Tim, um, Tim Kennedy was talking, he was going to, he's starting a school for, for kids. And I was like, oh God, what does that look like? You know, I mean, Tim's a really talented intense. dude and intense guy. But can with you imagine a, with a hint of insanity? Yeah, can you imagine like going through Tim Kennedy's like school? At, I just imagining like last time I was in Texas, I was at his house and he was talking about this. Yeah, it, dude. it was uh, right before we went over to his house. We went and did a little bit of jujitsu, and by that I mean he fucking smashed me like a thousand pound bag of right. sharp edged boulders. Yeah. Oh my god, dude! It's actually hard to describe. And he he wasn't he was he's just a, such a high level practitioner. People be like, oh, you know. Is Tim Kennedy any good? I'm like, yeah, oh, motherfucker. Yeah. No. Sports. But he was talking about that school. And in my head, I was like, is there, you, you guys don't have any like whips, do you? <laughs> or, or like a yoke? You guys don't have that thing where you put your hands in there in the from, head, from right? From Conan? <laughs> yeah. So what's the, do you, did you unpack it with them? Were you like talking in depth? I did it? not. They oh, were, okay. they were doing a high level business meeting. So I was actually doing my best to stay out of it. But they, right. I just remember the topic of the school coming up. It'll be interesting for sure. It may yeah, be yeah. a non traditional um, scholastic approach. I would imagine. I, I can't, I would, I would love to see that happen with a bunch of former, you know, mill guys or whatever it is that are kind of, I could see it really, ending up a lot like the hunger games though. Yeah, I know. I think that's a double edged sword. I think you'd have a, a position where you're like, okay, the, our kids are going to be really fucking hard and very talented. And they're going to be like, you know, Brazilian jujitsu practitioners and they're going to be really fucking smart and ultra violent capable people. Or it might just really fuck them up. I don't know. But yeah. I think that I'd probably move to the lat or not the latter, but the, the pre yeah. and say, hey. As long as you controlled it because they are so young. Yeah. You know, you'd look at this stuff, what we're talking about, like our fondest memories. We're, we're into our teens. late, late teens, yeah. early 20s. Right. I think you, uh, yeah, you know, maybe Conan the Barbarian. Wait, yeah. wait till your later teens for that. <laughs> that guy, but that guy is so. He has so much fucking energy. I loved him. Dude, he is, he is so awesome. much fun. That guy, he if he comes down and does a podcast or anything, you know, he'll he'll call randomly. Hey man, what's going on? What do you think we do something? Let me check my calendar. Okay, I've got a nearest opening is six months from now. Yeah. I have like, got you on the book dude, for January you. 2037. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Three to five. You good with that? I'm like, yeah. Oh, by the okay. way, AM. Yeah, AM. You good with that? <laughs> okay. Okay. No, he's awesome, man. It's, uh, yeah. He took the time, like, went, flew in there, took the time, 
met me at the private uh the gym god damn it what's the name of the brand it's a sunglass brand and amazing facility smashed the living fuck out of me and then came and shot the next day but he's the best and i was i referenced the podcast when he was on with joe the last time yeah people will look at him like oh he's just a knuckle driving dragging savage and there's an essence of that but he's also so incredibly articulate and talking about national strategy right the green beret strategy counterinsurgency the layers of warfare it's like don't you're doing yourself a disservice if you sell that motherfucker short well i think i think that's one thing that a lot of guys you know they default to that because they say well we're just you know knuckle draggers <laughs> i think uh you know a guy like tim he's he's incredibly talented and uh, across the board a wide variety of things and i think that actually puts people at ease when he says something like that because if he didn't I think people would have a really fucking hard time engaging with him because they would be so intimidated from all life's accomplishments. Yeah. They would be like, that guy's unapproachable. He's not. He's fucking, he's a really- He's the opposite of that, He's a very fucking approachable person. Uh, You know, one of my favorite scenes is psychology is more contagious than the flu. So with a guy like him, he's always like, fuck yeah, let's go. Let's do this. Let's do that. That guy is such a necessity- to I think a collective psychology and improving just positivity, uh, it, we we need more people actually like him in the community. Just going fuck it, man. Let's you do you. Let's roll. Yeah. Let's have fun. Yeah. Beat and, each other up. Let's go to the range. Let's and, have fun. And less people that are like, you're not in my lane of traffic, so you're wrong. Yeah. I actually think developing or training as hard as he has, I think it makes him or people in general more open to other people's ideas because you're more secure in yourself. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, like I can imagine, or I can only imagine, have being somebody who was never untested in any physical arena, or maybe they even grew up in an environment where they're not even tested mentally, you know, yeah. or emotionally. How confident are you going to be absent ever being tested? As opposed to a guy like that who's gone up against the best in the world. Like, what does he fucking care? He doesn't care. Agree and, or disagree? He's like, I know who I am. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's no, there's no longer any point to try to prove. And there's a lot of people that unfortunately have had every idea. And every issue, somebody is going to just placate to what they're saying, right? Or give them a gold star for coming up with it, whether it's right, wrong, or they're indifferent to it. And that's that's not giving you any challenge. And when you're not challenged with some sort of repercussion on the back end, right? You know, failure or winning, if you want to say winning, or a degree or whatever the, the case may be, then you're, you're legitimately unsure or you're going to be intensely arrogant about everything you have to say and everybody needs to listen to everything you have to say because it is correct because it's coming out of your mouth i think that's ego and compensation yeah. right so it's it's a default position for people i think to be uh you know louder if they're compensating for some type of issue insecurity insecurity yeah and i think small pennies well a lot of us i think that's the freedom that a lot of us have because you know i was i was i was telling somebody this a while ago where it's like man i really don't have anything to prove to anyone in my life i mean i have to be a good father nor the desire to prove anything to anybody anymore okay i i know you know i know who i am i'm pretty confident with who i am at the end of the day i think you know i've heard this from a lot of my friends they were like oh you know what was combat like i wish i would have you know joined and had that experience i'm like no you don't dude you don't fucking like why how how many of my friends have have fucking dove into a bottle because they can't drink away their demons you know how many of my friends are missing fucking you know their legs or their limbs or Or just missing in general they're just missing in general i'm like you don't fucking need that experience like you don't need it broken families yeah Yeah. broken families like there's there's a there's a there's a hole i think in some men or women but generally the conversations i have is with men they're like well they feel inadequate because they haven't had that experience and i continue to talk to them and like dude you you do you man that's that's the great thing about this country is you get to be whoever the fuck you want to be but don't think about what you could or should have done that's that's just fucking lost effort and energy it's not the way to go through life no but it has at least given me a level of security and freedom and knowing like Hey, I know who I am in a gunfight. Like I know that person. I know who I am if people are shooting at me. I know who I am if people are from shooting at people. Like I know that. I know what kind of a team member I am. 
I don't really have to question that because I know who that person is, which allows me, I think, a certain freedom to just kind of fucking send it. Uh, and then if people don't like it, they obviously oh, well. are just, oh, well, okay, that's cool. I mean, I'm not going to leave it. I'm not going to leave anything on the table in this life. I'm not going to be like, oh, man, I should have done that. It's like, no, if I want to do it, I'm going to go fucking do it. I'm not going to leave. That, that's my fear, I think, in a lot of these, in, in just life in general, if I have any fears, is like, is leaving something undone. Like, what do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? What type of man do I want to be? Uh, what type of person do I want to be to my family? I think that's my driving force 90% of the time. What kind of a man do I want to be? What What are my children going to look to me and then discover, learn, and then think about when I'm fucking long dead and gone? Are they going to think of me as a good man? Are they going to think of me as a good father? Um, that's kind of my driving force. Whereas before this... Uh, you know, it was what kind of a team, what kind of a team member am I? Like what kind of an individual or team member am I? And I think it kind of goes back and forth. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting how priorities change. I think definitely once I had kids, those things really change. I think just having that freedom of knowing I'm good, I'm good with myself. Uh, a lot of guys don't have that. They kind of live in a, in a, in a life of questioning themselves in some, to some degree which I think is truly unfortunate because I talked to a ton of guys. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? You don't need to, you don't need that experience. Like you're a great guy. Well, and you can find the test <laughs> elsewhere outside of a combat environment. You can, you know what I mean? That's yeah. it's a solvable problem for people. You don't have to wonder whether or not you're good enough to do fill in the blank. Go find a test that replicates, you know, for some people, Hey, go run a marathon. Maybe that's sure. your test. Yeah. Or a uh, Ironman or the, whatever the Spartan one is where you race. Yeah. The one shit. you jump in the mud, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> Avoiding discomfort is not the way to answer that question. Oh, God, no. No, you, you have to be so fucking uncomfortable and ready to quit. Uh, you're, you're, you, I think physically and mentally, you have to be prepared to put yourself into a position where you think everything is going to collapse like a fucking dying star. When you feel that energy and you're pushed back against it, that's, I think, when you really start to feel, oh, okay, this is who I am. Uh, if you don't ever get to that position, you'll never really know and then you'll always question yeah. who that person is. Well, and it makes sense when you look at what we are, right? You know, we're, we're a machine that was designed millions and millions of years ago, you know, through evolution, right? So we're this hardware that's millions of years old with software from yesterday. So your hardware wants to be stressed. Your hardware wants those stressors. It wants that kind of feeling, and it needs that sort of affirmation of success whether that's i plan to call it a hunt and then i'm successful right it doesn't have to be physically incredibly difficult right but the world has to have the repercussion of the star is going to fall apart you know like that yeah th that's going to happen or i'm going to i'm going to starve that's what our bodies want that's what we genetically need and i think there's a lot of people that are constantly have their entire life just softly given the ability to take an exit here and cross over and I'm sort of going to sort of going to get to the end state in the easiest way possible. And now you're an adult and the only way to get a stress out of life is by lashing out and yeah. being enraged at name the thing. Name I, the it's, thing. it's it's everything from using the word nuance <laughs> I didn't know that was a forbidden noise I didn't that you either. can make with your mouth. Yeah, I didn't either. To, uh, I don't know, donating to a ecologic group. Like, you know, I donate to Ocean Conservancy. Like, are people going to think I'm a, a crazy eco-warrior? Yeah. I, I mean, there's a what the portion. shit? Maybe like, you, what, you know, yeah. yeah, I like the earth. We got the one. It's pretty rad. It's pretty cool. Well, I think that, that lumping people into pre-designated definitions i think one that's that's a simple way for people to just kind of live life and say this is who i am this is you know i'm just going to fit this box uh you and i've talked about that all, for a long time it's like there's nothing wrong with thinking like hey you know clean air is pretty cool i like to breathe it uh you know maybe we should think about how what we do affects those people around us so you know one of the conversations i was having 
was putting an afterburner on our roasters. I was like, no, we need to put afterburners on them. We want to burn off all the excess uh, fucking smoke because we don't need to contribute to it. So what? Is that just reburn the uh, yeah, it just burns the residual? It. Yeah, it just burns off the excess smoke. So literally, you're just you're burning the smoke, and so all of that essentially excess carbon that's released into the air, you're burning it again. Uh, and there's no reason to add to the trash in the air, especially in Salt Lake, because we deal with inversion mm -hmm. all the fucking time. The air is horrible in Salt Lake. Uh, half the time we have to have air filters in every one of our rooms and our offices. In the wintertime, it gets really fucking bad. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to contribute to that. I'm all good. Like, we're going to burn off the excess smoke. That's what we're going to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. You okay. crazy hippie. Yeah, you crazy hippie. And it's like, ah, not really. It's Just like, you can't do that and care about guns. You can't, I guess. I guess you know. You, Pick one, you're, Evan. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna drift across <laughs> the lines. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? They are gonna brainwash you if you start believing those hippie thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking about hippie thoughts, what the fuck are you doing hunting with a bow from 1400s technology? Mm. How's I, that gone for you this season? Um, I've drawn back zero times. Zero. Right. Zero. Um, How? What's your effective range with that thing? On an elk. Just in general, Ish. uh, I'm I've been, I mean, check the internets, but I've been routinely consistent at putting a softball size group at 20, like dinner played at 30 is, yeah. is pretty, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, most days, you know, like the Instagram days, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'd say most of the time that's about where I'm at. Um, I picked it up purely out of curiosity and then talking to Jeff you were, Shapiro. You were trad. Curious. I was trad curious. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, falconry curious too. I was falconry curious. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jeff. But uh, first off, everybody should be falconry curious because when I sat down with him, I was like, oh my "What? God. You hunt with a flying friend? That's Fuck. fucking badass." <laughs> so I, I mean, I got to, I got to watch Cirrus kill a pheasant uh, so about a awesome. month ago. It was it's fucking, fucking really cool. But uh, he asked. He's like, you know, you want to come up and hunt? Cool. Um, you know, if you want to hunt with a trad bow, that'd be really cool because he hunts with a longbow. And he's hunted with compound rifle. He did, like he'll put food in the freezer. Period. What's the difference between a trad bow and a long bow? Well, so trad's more like the macro group. So everything from recurves to pure English long bows or self bows, like just right. a stick that is bent. Bent. Yeah. Um, and he's hunted with a long bow for a long time. And so I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, what is the issue with me wanting to learn something that makes it a little more difficult? I have to get closer. So I like how you use the, the word a little, a little bit, <laughs> the, like exponentially. Wh what's been kind of cool though is it's forced my like, picture tactically of the scene right. to change. You know, it's only going to improve my ability to hunt with a rifle and a compound. Oh, for sure. Because yeah. I'm forcing myself to think of how to get within range and have a shooting lane for a thing that arcs like a like a rainbow. And I have to be sort of within the 25 or 30 yard range. What kind of penetration would you get with that thing? Fantastic. Uh, I mean, I'm shooting like a 650 green setup with a 65 pound bow. What kind of feet per second are you getting? Just somewhere just over 200. But I mean, it's getting over 60 foot pounds of force um, when it's hitting a target. So it's actually better than I thought it would have been. They're blowing right through elk at that right. range. You know, if it's soft tissue stuff. Right. Um, and I mean, we people have been hunting with those for... 100,000 years, right? So uh, obviously they were putting 30 arrows into those things because those were between 20 and 30 pound bows. Right. But it's a phenomenal killing machine. It, it works fantastic. And the proof is out there. I have not shot an animal with one yet. Yeah. I would like to. Did you fill your Montana tag with anything? Not yet. The shoulder season is lives. all you've got left. It's okay. all I've got left. And the rifle season ended Sunday. I know. So I'm coming up for shoulder season. <laughs> What does um, that mean? What's shoulder season? I don't know so they open up some a units. season on like the shoulder of the. Yeah. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. yeah, it's on the back end. So it's really just to and fill I my tag. Think it's cow only. Uh, yeah, Depending almost on the everywhere. District. Yeah. Um, I'm still going up into the Wasatch looking for elk with the with the recurve. I'm just dead set on giving it a go. You know, like what's I'm in a fortunate position where I can learn that skill and then give it a shot, and I still have stuff in the freezer. I still have meat from animals that I've killed. Yeah, you'll have moose meat for the next fucking four Forever. decades. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is great. You know, so it leaves me in a spot where I've now found this thing that is very, it's very cool. It, it's it's sharp, pointy stick golf. Like, yeah, 
It's fucking really cool. There's nothing to it. It's a stick, a string, and then another stick with a pointy end. And that's how I hunt too, but it's, it's just a suppressed 308 on the tripod. <laughs> yeah. Some sticks. Though. Yeah, it's, some sticks. <laughs> it's just a stick in a, in a projectile. That's all it is. Super At simple. a baseline level, we're talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah, Something that goes from A to B with some kinetic energy is yeah. what we're talking about. And I mean, I'm more than happy to shoot something with a rifle. It's just that that recurve has been, it's been a really interesting learning curve. And I like how difficult it is. Yeah. Um, I'm still shooting the compound all the time because there's going to be hunts where the recurve might not be appropriate. Right. right. Not in the next five or 10 years. Like, yeah. it, not in the amount of time that I've practiced this thing. I kind of got forced into rifle season or rifle hunting this year because I yep. jacked up my elbow. And uh, I was sitting there like, God, do I really want to do this? Is this fair? Right. Is this fair for the animal? Yeah. <laughs> Which is why, and we talked about this when you yeah. asked me if I wanted to go on that first hunt. You know, years ago, it's like, yeah, I never, I was never really interested in hunting because my family didn't, I didn't grow up with that on the radar. Yeah. And then I didn't, either. after I spent time in the military, I'm like, well, that doesn't seem very fun or right. challenging. Why yeah. would I shoot something like it's 400 yards? I, they make us shoot a target with iron sights that far. Like, right. Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, why I would actually, I do that? I, I actually I, really enjoyed it because I got to expose two people to Leah got her first deer right. with the rifle. It's awesome. And for here's the thing, too. I have a suppressor on the 308 that I use, and people are like, well, why did you do that? I'm like, first off, it makes weapons more accessible to people. Yeah. yeah. It reduces anticipation, because when you're not expecting a fucking cannon to go off in your hands, you can sit there and actually have excellent trigger control, because you're not closing your eyes like, oh, God, it's going to go off. Yeah. And also, if you miss, which guess what, people, happens to everybody, most of the time the animals will still stand there. Right. Yep. So it made it super accessible. The guy who makes the uh, podcast T-shirts... Got a, he got a doe at his house, and then I was actually able to get a buck at his house. We'll leave out the details. It was right. legal. My feet were on the ground. Right. <laughs> feet were on the ground. <laughs> feet yeah. were on the ground. Um, and at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? This is. It was just more about sharing the experience. So it actually, I was thinking about it. I'm like, okay, bow hunting is awesome for all of us, but really hard to show other people who don't bow hunt. Absolutely. Rifle hunting, still difficult depending on who yeah. you are, but so much more accessible right. to show people. Yeah, I, it, we did the, I did a rifle hunt with my dad this year. We both killed elk up in Utah. And, you know, I was telling you that story where, you know, the first time my dad shot past 100 was with the 6.5. The first time he'd shot even a, a you know, box-fed semi-auto fucking rifle was, was, was then as well. <laughs> and it was such a different experience for him. Uh, because we went out and we tried to shoot these 30 odd sixes that were literally 40 years old. Uh, I had one that was my grandfather's one that was mine and we couldn't get them to group past a hundred. Imagine that. Uh, Weird. so we threw in, you know, modern seeking six fives and he was shooting out to five, six, seven, eight within 45 minutes. And then he went out that afternoon after zeroing his rifle and killed an elk in one shot, literally took maybe three steps. Oh yeah. And he was right above the heart. Like it was no problem whatsoever. My dad was like, and that was his first elk, right? No, he's, <laughs> he's killed a lot of elk before. Uh, this was his first elk in probably 25, 30 years. And he got the bug again, right? He got the shooting bug again. He yeah. got back into like that head where he's like, Oh shit, I can shoot out to distance. I don't need, to you know get my glasses and get everything ready like he's like oh I'll take my hearing aids out i'm already dead you know, i'm already <laughs> deaf either way and not advisable people <laughs> right uh but it's the same thing right yeah. bolt on a can screw on a can and it, it changed the can people don't understand how much it changes, changes the experience for people but remember evan but that, also that for rifle people- looks like an ar and with a suppressor you're evil. But also, yeah. well, here, two things on that. One, for people listening to this, don't just throw a can on your gun. Research your local mm-hmm. regulations. Because like in Montana, it was illegal for a long time. Right. It is now legal. Don't go hunting with a suppressor on your gun unless you check to make sure. And two, yeah, the assault rifle one is, uh, I get lost on that. I don't know what <sighs> makes a rifle an assault rifle. I mean, it, yeah, I don't I'm, I don't either. Like, I, I don't no, know I was what's just classifying what. It's particularly like, being flippant because it's ridiculous. What's a semi-auto box-fed fucking? Well, that's what classifies it. Like collapsible buttstock. Yeah, 
shit like that. Yeah. It, I mean, it, we'd have to read into the regulations to exactly what it fucking looks like, but I think it's literally just the way it looks. I think that's what intimidates people. Uh, you know, whether or not they're classifying every semi-auto, I don't fucking know. I don't even know where you'd start to begin to unpack all that bullshit and yeah. why they even want to. Um, I know that, you know, that's the majority of what we have in our safes. Like, that's what we have because I'm comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah. And, and they're efficient. They're very efficient, you know. So for us, you know, Matt and I will go out and shoot like, you know, 300 blackout or, you know, suppress 300 blackout with fucking subs. That Sounds like a paintball gun. It's amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing experience. I bought these air rifles for my kids so they could learn how to shoot because there's, you know, virtually zero recoil, Quiet. zero noise. My wife is, she's a great pistol shooter. Uh, she hasn't shot a lot of rifles. So for her, it was like really easy entry level, like get in, start shooting, get, you know, used to the rhythm and what's, what's happening with this device, like how to load it, how to shoot yeah. it, how to be proficient and safe. Uh, so I don't really discriminate against any platform. Like I shoot traditional bow. I shoot my compound bow, like in any week in the, in the back of our facility in Salt Lake, <laughs> We've got fucking targets that are we can shoot out to a hundred off the back deck next to the roaster. You will find me breaking arrows with my trad bow. Smash them into the concrete wall, <laughs> and like I, for me, I've I've really kind of just classified myself as a projectile enthusiast because I just like to hit targets. It's what I like to fucking do. Same. And it doesn't really matter. Like I have a muzzle. I've got muzzle loaders. I've got fucking the whole nine. That's one I haven't gotten into. It's fun. Did you get into that just because it gave you access to a different season? No, I, I grew up <laughs> shooting black powder. Did like, you really? Yeah, I grew up. So we used to go to these uh, black powder rendezvous. Like the full on just... Yeah. Sh sh how I learned how to shoot was with a black powder rifle. That's how I learned how to shoot. My grandfather, my father, my uncle, everybody shot black powder at black powder rendezvous. So we go what out. What is a black powder rendezvous? It's a mountain man festival. It is. It's a mountain man festival. That's so all it broke is. So back mountain man festival. <laughs> well, I mean... No, not exactly that definition. But like but partially. Par Mostly. Kinda, maybe. I'm sure there was some of that going on. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we, uh, but yeah, I, I grew up, it was a 32 caliber black powder rifle. I had a little fucking powder horn and, you know, loading it up with your, your ball skins. and your patch and wearing a, what's called a capote, which is this old wool fucking robe looking thing Fuck yes. <laughs> and s sleeping in teepees and shit. You go out in the, into the mountains and you do these things called trail walks and you'd walk around and you'd compete against other shooters in a trail walk. So you'd have like tomahawk and knife throwing stations and fucking shooting stations with pistol and rifle. And so kids as a kid, it was awesome because you'd compete in fire starting competitions, tomahawk and knife throws shooting, you know, 32 caliber, muzzle a rifle this is what i see tim's school looking like yeah exactly yeah that's kind of the way this I is see orientation it. yeah for his school this is orientation like orientation week knife sharpening all this kind of yeah. weird random shit that we would do and uh and it was so much fun for a kid because you could just let your imagination run wild when you were you know six seven eight years old cruising around in the mountains with like moccasins and a fucking wool robe basically and a powder horn you got your own rifle and i feel uh, like i need a powder horn now dude it's rad it's it's it's, a, it's so much fun because could you fill it with like whiskey yeah you could you could all fill right, it perfect. with anything you want <laughs> it's gonna leak all over the place and probably Fuck. make you smell like booze the entire time but nonetheless it's super fun whoever won would go to uh they'd spread out these big fucking blankets and then the person that got first got first pick. So you'd all have to donate. So whoever's in this competition, you have to donate something. And then the person that's first gets first pick. And then they'd start going down through the list. And it to was the victor go the spoils. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So that's how I learned how to fucking shoot a rifle. Have you ever hunted black powder? No. I mean, pheasant. Uh, I've watched the the meat eater dude, dude. Why can't I think of his name? Steve, right now? No, Steve Brunelli, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he was after it was mule deer or something like that. Right. It's it's different. It's a different experience. I think you've got modern muzzleloaders, which are different than kind yeah. of the traditional, where you have your ramrod and horn, all this other stuff, and you got ball. So it's straight up lead. Uh, 
I remember, you know, my grandfather making like lead balls. So he had a, he had a smelter. little smelter. Yeah, or smelter where he'd be pouring and making his balls and <laughs> knocking his, them out. And doing, doing his little Patriot thing. thing. Yeah. It was, it was pretty rad, man, it's because cool. as a kid, you had all that crazy mountain man shit going on at the same time. Like all these dudes were working in the woods. So I would go out and shoot either my 22 or my 32. And most of the time, like I had free access to the 32 because there's not much you can fucking mess up with that thing. It's, you yeah. know, you got to put the cap on <laughs> back, set the trigger. So you'd have a trigger set. You have two triggers. So one sets it, one fucking shoots it. It's fucking wild, man. It's, it's a wild experience. No NDs with that. No. You're not going to get, well, you will. You, you certainly could, but you got to put some more effort. It's going to be put a lot of effort have, into it. Yeah, yeah, you really do. <sighs> yeah. You've you got the uh, jujitsu itch yet? I know we were texting about it. Oh, yeah. You but, haven't done uh, it? Well, he did it for a while. A little, yeah. Right. He was there when Dudley's neck was broken by Draco. <laughs> I, I have great, I have really good <laughs> pictures of the whole event. Do you really? Oh, yeah. And, the, and he, no shit, like, broke his neck. Part of it. How did he do that? I mean, he held him down, and then he just jumped up and down on his throat. Okay, that's. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jocko doesn't that's, want to tell that right. story. That's yeah, what I remember. Yeah. No, it. Uh, he was doing a choke that involved your entire fist on the Adam's apple, right? Uh, and then applying pressure through your sternum. And Dudley, because he's not a jujitsu practitioner, put his massive fucking man arms behind his back and pulled Jocko into him, which increased. Got the it. amount of pressure until his, I believe it was the hyoid bone, had a little bit of a crack in it. Holy shit. But we were both there. It was, I had only been at it for a few months then, and we were scrapping around and fucking around, and I've been yeah. texting him about it ever since. I'm sure there's an awesome jujitsu scene down in Salt Lake. It's the same time frame that uh, we were teaching Dud to Skadef. That's that right. was the same time period. Mm-hmm. It was actually the same weekend because we did. Yeah. And it was the same day we put uh, Jocko and his kids in the tunnel. Yep. Oh, entertaining. We did because we did that. Uh, we did that archery event. That that's was right. all that same weekend. Yeah, it was all the same weekend. Yeah. We the archery event. That's where the comedy we show. I met you. Yep. Oh, we did yeah. the comedy show at yeah, we did Joe, yeah, Joe's yeah. comedy show because he came down to the yep. uh, to the archery thing. To the archery thing. Yep. Yeah, that was all the same weekend. Oh we, my god, that was a fucking whirlwind. It was because like, we were trying. It, actually, you were at the tunnel with Jocko. Yeah. 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 No. That was like I the, saw him trying to dominate the air. That was the whole team. No, he got was dominated. Barclay was there. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's how I explain to people how Jocko likes to free fall. It's like I'm going to capture all of this air. <laughs> <laughs> you will submit. You will submit oh. air. Which uh, was fucking awesome. It was, that whole weekend was awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I forgot that that was all. I, for and, some uh, reason, I had like partitioned. We stayed at Bob's place. For, you for, stayed for at dinner. Bob's place. I, yeah, I stayed at my uh, brother-in-law and sister's house yeah. in Oceanside. That was a fun couple days. Yeah, we need to do more shit like that when the world allows us to do fun shit. Yeah. yeah. When we're not on lockdown, when, when we don't have to stay in home and wear our masks. Or like bending knees. Citizens. Yeah, we're what's your over-under for when you think things will be relaxed oh, or back gosh. to semi-normal? You know, <laughs> dude, your guess is as good as mine. Your next appointment this. with Tim Kennedy, like, uh, 2037 at 3 a.m.? My guess is Q3 21. Yeah, I, I think I think we're going to be... I think this next year is going to be a fucking Ridiculous. shit show. I think it's going to be a shit show. Well, I think you're going to have rolling shutdowns. I think you're going to have mask mandates and travel fucking lockdowns. You're going to have all, this, all the kind of shit that we were seeing in the beginning of this. You're going to have it again. Well, and they're looking at... I mean, you just look at the rollout dates for vaccine, right? Like general public isn't till next summer, maybe. What are your thoughts on taking a brand new vaccine? Uh, you know, I've done that one once, right, with the anthrax vaccine. You remember mm-hmm. that one before the invasion I do. of Iraq? Yeah. Uh, and with kind of the long-term health effects that that's kind of yielding, I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, imagine that, being a skeptic in today's day and age, just not gulping it down. Uh, you know, anything that you kind of... Uh, rush to market. I think everybody should be a little bit skeptical of. Uh, but I think that there's probably a percentage of the population that, you know, obviously that the really at risk portion of yeah. our population, uh, if it helps get small and medium sized businesses back up and running, uh, fuck, I'm all for it. Like if that's what it takes, like let's get fucking small and medium sized businesses up and running because well, and this has been devastating. From the doctors and researchers yeah. that I personally know, They've all said that 
from what they've read and seen, none of the steps have been cut short. What this is going to do is actually help on the back end other vaccines and other research go further faster. Right. Because a lot of the bureaucratic red tape, which is what takes so many of these vaccines so long. They were able to cut through it. They've been they've been chopping it because this is now a worldwide thing as opposed to that's that country's problem, that's this country's problem. Right. So based on what they're saying, no, I don't want to be first in line because I can be paranoid at times, but... But you're also at one of the lowest risk categories as well. And I agree with you. Like if you're at a high risk, I mean, I'm also very skeptical. I had that same series of vaccination, vaccinations offered to me. I squirted them in the garbage can, right. full disclosure. Uh, but yeah, I don't actually want to be first in line. I think people should do their own risk assessment on that one. And if for the high risk category, fuck yes. I should prioritize those people. Yeah. But if you're ultra low risk... Might be some benefit to giving it a little bit of time in the saddle to see how that thing plays but out. But I don't ascribe to the tinfoil hat. They're putting microchips, Same. or this is going to absolutely kill you, or turn you Dude, into an autistic crazy person. Like what they needed to do, they the changed the batteries out. out in the seagulls. Right, they're all <laughs> yeah. fucking out now. Yeah. So look, Andy, yeah. that's a secret we were supposed to keep. The birds aren't real. Yeah, I mean, it takes a while to switch out all the batteries. It does. I mean, there's a lot of birds. They but said it was two weeks, two hands. Hands. nine months. <laughs> now, I, I hope they. I hope they find a medical solution for it i really do i mean we were walking down main street cowspell i was pointing yeah. out to you that it used to be a fly shop and now it's this massive cavernous space and i can only imagine even here where economically you know the price of commercial real estate's got to be lower but i can only imagine the monthly nut on that place and how much foot traffic you would need i mean come on well i think when i really look at it and i look at kind of the consolidation of business between what's happening, right? So when we look at just like, we were talking about the logistics of it, uh, just from an e-com perspective, limiting how many packages, small, medium-sized businesses can ship out over holiday season because of COVID. And in consolidating between basically the two main retailers in the United States, which is Walmart and Amazon, this will be catastrophic for small and medium-sized businesses. A lot of these people you know, they, if they're a small e-com company, they're going to try to collect 50% of their revenue over holiday season. Uh, so if you can't ship packages, you can't get your packages to people in time. Yeah. That's going to be a huge impact. And and what's their solution? Bend the knee to Amazon and just put your shit on an Amazon marketplace and give them part of your money? No, that's, that's I mean, for right now, that's I think- That's literally all they can that, do. That's all they can do. Yep. Uh, or go out of business. Or go out of business. So what we're seeing- is the death of small and medium-sized businesses. That's what's happening. And the solidification of massive- Correct. Massive businesses. So when we do the long play on this in, in a purely kind of pessimistic look, you would see- It's just realistic. Consolidation of retail into the two main retailers, right? Two main big box retailers. People moving their professions from what they might do in, in a mom and pop retail store or a local type retail establishment. They would be moving to more of a fulfillment type job. So when we look at this 1984 Orwellian. What's that fucking noise? Did I leave the AC on again? Probably. I don't, I don't think know. so. It probably just got started. Oh, yeah. I was like, hmm. That's the second time I've done that. People actually enjoyed it the first time I did it. They're like, yeah, dude, keep leaving the AC brakes in. <laughs> no <laughs> idea why, but most of you guys are like, you're a fucking idiot. I'm like, yeah, I know. Got you left it. it on? I don't know. I thought yeah. it was off. That's all right. I don't. right. We've been at this for a while, and it didn't come on. A bit. That's okay. I don't know why it had to come on now. What the yeah. fuck is wrong with this thing? But that is what's going on, is you're looking at a, the... <laughs> One of the largest transferences of wealth and ability in human history. Yeah. Well, it, it's getting flipped right over. I, I mean, multi digit percentage point growth in personal capital for people that already have more than $50 billion. That's a good number. That's insane. And they're yeah. getting multi, multiple digit percentage points. And, you know, and I have this debate because of, you know, I'm a capitalist. I mean, uh, I, I believe in the system. I have this debate because there's a, there's, a, I think, a distinct difference between the free market capitalist and then ultimately that the cards are completely, the, the, the deck is completely stacked. 
So when we look at the deck is completely stacked over on the corporate side, they have billions of dollars to essentially yield the outcome they desire. And, and we would be foolish yeah. to think that they're not stacking the deck in their favor to take advantage of a scenario like this where they can yeah. drive out their competitors on a large scale level. I think everybody would be a little bit remiss and a little bit foolish to think that that wouldn't be an end game, regardless of what they think. Uh, that is an end game. So how do you do it? You know, do you go into uh, a monopoly busting or trust busting type scenario where you're breaking these entities up? Uh, I don't know. I mean, truly, I don't know what the right answer is in this. I know that we feel it because we talk to a ton of you know smaller veteran-owned econ businesses. Uh, we we hear it. We feel it from a from a large scale perspective, just in our own limitation of packages, uh, and we can't really compete. We can't compete with, you know, Amazon or Walmart or their Is there of, anybody that can? I don't think so. At this point, uh, you know, it's kind of like the algorithm on social media, you know, we're never going to be able to unring that bell. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to pull ourselves out of this. And I don't know how we're going to pull retail back from COVID, put it back into the hands of more localized establishments. Well, the only way is like you just described, which won't happen because- K Street is too strong. Right. You know, antitrust is the only way to make that a thing. And if they don't ring that bell, then too fucking bad for everybody else, apparently. And and it the, the worst part, people want to be a victim. They want to say they're you know, the cards are getting stacked against us. No, no, no. It's far worse. Right. They're not spending any of their intellectual time thinking about stacking cards against you, and I mean you being any business owner or person. They're thinking only about stacking more cards in their deck. That's it. That's it. It's far worse. They're, they're, they're just stacking more. More, 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 more. Not, it's not against you because they couldn't give a shit. You don't matter. That's the problem. People don't see it. You know, they're, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm being, I have so much against me. Like, no, 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 no. They have so much for them. Right. That's the problem. Like, you're in a race riding a bicycle against an F1 car. <laughs> and every time you get somebody to help you with your tire, they get another F1 car. Right. That's how this is working. Yeah, I don't think I could be I could not be convinced to open a brick and mortar pure retail store selling just one thing on Main Street Kalispell. Yeah. I, it, to me it would seem like the riskiest of gambles. Yeah. With Ex uncertainty except masks. Okay, I hadn't really considered that. Showing masks. <laughs> Designer maybe. masks. Yeah, Designer maybe. masks. But I mean, who, who's going to feel comfortable yeah. pursuing that path after 18 months of just having it shoved down their throat? Yeah. And then, who's, and then the, the property holders, the people that actually own the property, that are renting out the space, you know, the long-term effects of this, you can't print enough money to, to get yourself out of this hole. You know, it, when I say that, it's like if people understand how inflation works and devaluing the dollar, these schemes don't fucking work. You can't print more money to pay for debt. the debt of some dimwit that wants to go get a Venetian black, you know, glass blowing degree or PhD that can't get a job for above 1550 an hour. Like you can't print enough money to recover from that plan. It's not a plan. And what people don't even understand is that it's already controlled by the government. It's consolidated to three different type of financial institutions that are controlled by the government right now. So they've consolidated essentially a financial monopoly around the education system. And the government already has done that. So now what the next step is, they're like, well, we just want debt forgiveness for this. It's like, so you're going to make it everybody else's problem that you can't get a job with your degree. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to shut down small, medium-sized businesses. We're going to consolidate people back to their homes. you got to wear a fucking mask. You can't go out. You can't buy anything other than from an e-com store. So it's like the only jobs that you're going to be, be able to acquire will be from a big box retailer. Uh, and those are going to be lower paying jobs. They're not going to be high paying jobs. So it, it really but, doesn't look and, and fucking sunny. And people aren't seeing <laughs> yeah. even some of the, the second and third order effects. Like there's t two small businesses in Mill Creek that I've been to. One of them is somebody that sells olive oil and eggs, like farm right. fresh eggs. Yeah, well, they stopped doing it. 
uh, because they can't keep their employees because it's more lucrative for their employees to be on unemployment than it is for them to be getting the pay that they were getting paid. Yeah. I know some people like that as well. That's fucking insane. It was actually one of the most uh, financially beneficial times for them is when they had stopped working. Yeah. Right. And that's it's dangerous um, precedent to set. Yeah. Yeah. How do you incentivize Where do you think people? that's coming from? Like, does everybody just believe that that money's just getting printed? Like, it's just magic money? Well, no. What is going to happen? I mean, is... is well, it's well, not debt forgiveness. It's debt aggregation. Yeah. They're just spreading it out across the larger sample size than one. Yeah. yeah. And so it becomes everybody else's issue. Yeah. It's... And that's where there's a... For me, there's a definitive argument for less government equals more freedom. That's what it is. Less government equals more freedom, which also means you have to assume more personal responsibility for your actions. Uh, and that's what it's contradictory to human behavior. It's they there's a huge percentage, I think, of our population where they don't want more freedom. I think they proved that in the, you know, the the post 9-11. Um, what was the Patriot Act? Yeah, the Patriot Act. They willing. Well, they I was willingly. Gonna, I, I was going to say willingly, but I don't I don't believe the vast majority of people truly understood the breadth and depth of the reach or what could be more ap aptly described as overreach by the right. intelligence apparatus. I don't think a lot of people really knew. It's complicated and it's really detailed and complicated and it shifts around and ultimately you can't really track even legal liability when it comes to it and who's enforcing what and what's constitutional, what isn't constitutional. That's why it's so fucking dangerous to forfeit liberty to people that don't have your best interest in, at heart. Like that is the danger of all of this. When people are just so willingly able to accept a forfeiture of their rights, that's what scares me. Like that really scares me because people need to be able to push back. People need to be skeptics as to what the intentions are of the government, especially with so much corporate interest. When you have guys like that uh, that are out there, you know, whether they're you know rich financiers like Bloomberg or some of these other dudes that are pumping billions of dollars into essentially experiments that people don't even want in order to shift the dialogue, that's fucking dangerous. Like. And for us as a society, especially a free society, that's not the way we should be functioning, at least from my perspective. Like, who the fuck is Bill Gates? Like, who is he? So the he built a fucking goddamn computer. Why are we listening to this dude on vaccines? Because he funded some vaccine research in, in Africa? What, what pedestal do people put these billionaires on and why? What tech oligarch has got your best interest at heart? And what have they really developed... That, have, that has really benefited individual freedom. I mean, they're the guys that created this fucking garbage that people are consumed and gaslit on 24 hours a day, and they're self-admitting. You mean the personal tracking device? Yeah, they're self-admitting that it's wrong, <laughs> it's unethical. Oh, so we're, yeah. we, should in, we should listen to them more, for sure. We should buy into more of their bullshit because they don't have an objective in all this to make more money. And I think we're all fools if we just blanketly accept whatever a billionaire says because they're a billionaire. I think I, you should never blanketly accept what anybody says. Fuck no. A critical it, eye and, you know, objective reasoned thought, powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool. But if we eliminate the ability to even explore through Socratic method or logical debate, uh, that's when it's easier for... I think society be exploited. I've talked a lot about this on the military industrial complex and how it financially benefits from war. You can't have an entity that has so much influence in Washington that directly financially benefits from war, funding think tanks that directly validate. <laughs> it's a vicious ecosystem. Doing more war. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think when we look at the entire corporate structure as far as the money and influence in politics, we've got to really look and unpack all of that. The best thing that we can do is be very skeptical and debate it and not just swallow it down like mindless lemmings. And that's what I think. I, I think that's what we see is just this massive ability for people to group think across the board. They want to just go, oh, well, you know. Uh, Joe and Kamala, they're good people. We're just going to have to do what they say. It's like, okay, yeah, good idea. Wow. 
Like you guys have done really well for yourself on this because you're not, you're not willing to push back. You're not willing to push against the establishment. And, and that happens on both sides, whether you're, you know, left or right. Sure. And it's part of the two party system well, as well. And, and both groups are saying things like I've heard this statement and I'm, maybe you guys have heard it, but they say, oh, no, electing a president or, you know, politics, politics is a lot like getting on the bus. It might not be going exactly where you want, but you still have to get closer to where you're going. I'm like, no, the fuck I don't. No, you can I, walk. I'm going to I'm going to walk. <laughs> I'm going to buy a bicycle. Like there's all sorts of other ways around this. And by saying that, you are devaluing a large group of people, multiple groups of people, and their opinions. You know, the, the oh, you vote, you vote third party, like you're the enemy. You're, you're helping the other person win. Yeah, both parties use the third party yeah. as the scapegoat for, well, you're hurting fill in the blank. Yeah, 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 you are. You know what? You're taking votes away from that person's ability to maintain their, their seat in an elected spot and make money off of you. Yeah, that's what you're doing. And you know what? Fuck them. They really, they're a public servant. They're a public servant. But right are, now, they're, they're- But are they? No, no, no. Now, they're a public <laughs> leech. I mean, we, I we have so, senators yeah. and congressmen and women that are millionaires. Yeah. Not by their own strength and guile, only because they know people on K Street. I really don't think you should be allowed to be a career politician. Like, no. I think it's a bad sign if you've been in politics for longer than you've been out of it. Oh, yeah. It's it's a very, very bad sign. Yeah, or, you know, if you're old enough to be a senator and vote on an issue in Vietnam. I yeah. just, I, well, for one, I mean, I don't know that many politicians. The only one I actually know directly is Dan. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'm very wary of anybody who actually wants to go into that path. Because historically, I'm not impressed with what I see people who make that it, I mean, perhaps some of them are not trying to make it an occupation, but I am not impressed with the people that I see who have made it an occupation. Well, I think it de uh, it de incentivizes people because they they learn how to work the fucking levers in Washington. Right? Yeah. They learn the system, and then the system really becomes hard for anybody new to really understand. Yeah. Uh, so when you have 40, 30, whatever plus years in a profession where ultimately who's holding you accountable, your voters, but you can individually profit. I mean, for a long time, I, I'm, I'm somewhat aware of this, but there wasn't in, insider trading laws, for instance. So you could pass legislation and you could individually profit from the legislation that you were passing and you wouldn't be fucking rung up on in, insider trading. Well, how is that possible? Because we force bank executives to go through strict audits for insider trading, but we don't force the people that work writing for us- Writing the fucking writing laws. Writing the fucking laws. <laughs> Like, okay, when was the last time one of them went to jail for that or was even indicted? Good God. I don't fucking know. I mean, yeah, they run, they run up Flynn on that bullshit charge from, I don't know, like 1790 or some shit that they pulled out of the fucking, their thin air. You know, who is being termed, who's being termed for this? Like, like when you look at this entire shit show for the last. But remember, they're there for you. <laughs> yeah they're I, just I, not though like why can't we have again why can't we have an honest conversation about that but they're not there for us yeah no, no they're no. not zero sorry i'm sure some of you are good people but i'm all in favor of term limits for politicians at every single term, level term limits and or i think one of the best suggestions i heard from in my mind a very good friend of mine um he said you know what we should make it either exceptionally lucrative or literally, you only get a stipend. So you should just get a stipend to live, or right. it's fucking public housing in D.C. Yeah. Right? That's that's acceptable. Or you get paid a million and a half, two million. You, you get paid enough so that you're going to attract people from schools that would have otherwise been a CEO candidate at a large corporation. Right? You want to either attract the best and brightest or people that only want to serve. And then there should be a minimum and maximum age yeah. for the love of God. And the horseshit yeah. that we have going on now is uh, we're going to pay you enough so you're pretty comfortable. We're also going to make this so incredibly confusing that you can get away with almost anything. FYI, if you say the right thing to your constituents, you can be here for fucking ever. Well, I was, I was talking to Dan the other day about this 
The one-eyed pirate hooker? Yeah, congressman. Yeah, congressman. The one-eyed pirate yeah. hooker congressman? And From Texas. From Texas. He, he said, you know, people have this perception of there's just massive amounts of corruption throughout the entire political system, which is, a, it's, it's, that's not inaccurate. You have, uh, it, it's, it's inaccurate. It's like you have a, you have a blanket amount of corrupt people working within a system, <laughs> which is different because it's not a corrupt system. The yeah. system is actually fairly the people well running defined. the levers are the corrupt ones. Right. And they, they have ill intention and some people have the best of intentions, but the best of intentions sometimes fucking pave the road to hell. So you've got all these different people with conflicting ideology and they're all fucking battling it out within this system that ultimately they're saying in very Machiavellian terms, the means justify the end. Uh, and then you have obviously, you know, a separate entity of people that are, are wielding, you know, real cash to influence the outcome. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the only people I think that uh, from my perspective has true leadership uh, and I'm not making it, uh, you know, the, con the Dan Crenshaw fucking, I, I love you podcast, but he does exemplify real leadership. He understands what it's like, uh, to be deployed in the severities of war. He understands what it's like to be a veteran. He understands what it's like to be an academic. He's, he's got a lot of experience based knowledge that he brings to the table. I would find it very hard to believe that there's a lot of people in Congress or Senate that have that guy's life experience just in general. Um, I'd have to assume the Republican Party has got him on a trajectory. God, I would hope so. I, I you know, I mean, if there's, if there's, if any, they had any common fucking sense, they would. They would. They absolutely would. I. Well, yeah, but they'll wait fifty years. They'll wait till he's like seventy-five, because that seems to be the uh, the common. I think we're. I right think now. we're prepared as a country for somebody who's not pushing being an octogenarian or whatever the fuck that is, and who, who like hasn't been a card carrying yeah. AARP member for twenty years. I think we're ready. I mean, I think yeah. You know, I, I would love to see that debate right between AOC and Dan. Right, they're both they were both freshmen congressmen, and just the, these are the kind of public the, the the for us to grow as a society. I think. Congressmen should be able to challenge congressmen and senators should be able to challenge other senators to an open forum debate that is televised at any point in time. And you have to go. It's like, fuck you. Let's get on the debate stage. Get on the debate yeah. stage. Your ideas like, suck, but we're going to have an economy of ideas and let good ideas raise to the top. Yes, exactly. And we'll let the citizens decide based on how good you okay. are at articulating these facts. But, it, and you could call it kind of a modern day political duel, if you will. You know, not like Alexander Hamilton getting fucking smoked. Also, uh, though, that would kind of be sweet as well. Well, yeah. I mean, a fucking good old-fashioned duel. Might round the edges on people <laughs> running their fucking sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Burr. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I think that that would, that would emphasize a healthy dialogue throughout the United States. I think if we as citizens were like, hey... This is what we expect of you motherfuckers. At any point in time, somebody challenges you to an intellectual duel, you got to throw down. Yeah. Sorry. Too bad. You owe it to the public. You know, obviously there might be a limit to how many of those you would have to do, but at the end of the day, we should expect that from our politicians because I think people would start to see a more well-rounded and skeptical view of what's happening. And then when they see their fucking favorite politician just implode and fucking start on fire intellectually because they're dumb as fuck, they'd be like, oh, God, I can't vote this person back in. I mean, shouldn't that be the litmus test for what comes out of their mouth? It should be able to withstand the scrutiny of yes. the public specter and the pressure of somebody pushing back on those ideas. Yeah, and you should have a round or a round table or a town hall where people are coming in and talking about these ideas openly. I think that that's what happens with this two-party system is people get locked into their echo chambers and they don't have any accountability other to their voters and then they continue to talk to their voters and the people in their party and it just goes around and around and around and they're both talking at each other but they're not talking towards each other in a logical series of debates. But I think that is a forcing function to, to increasing people's awareness to what's actually happening on policy. Like... If we would have had a group of congressmen and senators debating Iraq on a fucking... Might have had a slightly different outcome. I yeah. don't think we would have gone. I don't think we would have either. Nope. I don't think... I. Afghanistan was unavoidable. Agreed. Like, unavoidable. Like there, But to increase 
troop levels in Afghanistan to a conventional occupying force. Like there should have been a long fucking national conversation about what was going on and the long-term effects of what this plays out, what it looks like, what is the strategic value of Afghanistan, uh, what is the strategic value of Iraq. Pull back the curtain. What's the strategic value of Syria? Yeah. What's the strategic what value of Syria? What the fuck? <laughs> like, wh- At the end of the day, you might come out with a lot of different options that people, it might unsettle their comfort level and break them out of their yeah. their box. And then in that process, I would hope that they would grow as human beings and therefore our society would continue to evolve. Yeah, and we might even get a third party in this, which I think would probably fucking be the best, one of the best things that we could have uh, in this country is a viable third party because it forces accountability on both ends versus these guys can, at the end of the day, they can start cutting deals. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. They can do whatever they want. No, I think... You know, one of probably the most important things that we have to do even, you know, in the next few weeks, right? I mean, Georgia is the battleground state, right? I mean, Georgia is is where everything will be determined. So if we think that it's going to be blue all the way through, uh, man, that does not look good. I think when you have blue all the way through that, that's a there's a lot of things that can happen really fucking fast that would have a direct impact on our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And that would be pretty fucking scary for, you know, Team Red not to be able to block that through filibuster uh, to keep maintain the majority. Uh, Jared just got back from Georgia. We were helping Dan film his next commercial, so we helped him on the first one, and we're helping him on the second one too. Uh, and, you know, that's because we fucking truly do believe in Dan uh, and kind of made the best ideas win. But uh, I think that, Anytime you have that fucking just long corridor of nothing but bad ideas fucking rolling through the halls, that's when you start to get things start to get really wonky when there's no checks and balances. I was just going to say that absent the ability to have a check and balance, it's it's not even bad ideas. You know, you're you're looking at something a little bit scarier, which is lockstep party line voting. You know, you look at the voting history of the House and the Senate. And from when it started till now, right? And the lockstep voting has become almost routine. Meaning they will only vote party lines. Only vote party yeah. line or abstain. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's hyper rare to abstain. And people get hammered for it. Yeah. Which is weird. There is no way that the constituents, by majority, of every one of those public servants, counties, or states is telling them to vote exactly the way that they're doing lockstep on every single vote for the last 35 years. There's no fucking way. That's, that, that, that is not how this works. That, that cannot be possible just statistically. Right. Right? So what we're seeing is a two-party system where both parties control their congressmen and women and their senators, and they do what they want. That's it. They're not there for you. The only way to make this happen a little more constructively is to get a third party in where now one of those two parties has to play a fucking game where they need that other party to help them out. And you know what happens? You get a little bit more discourse. Oh, yeah. Because if the thorn in the side is a problem for those guys over there or these guys over here, you're going to want them on your side. And if that's what that takes, that's what has to happen. Otherwise, we're going to maintain this lockstep approach and we're going to walk ourselves right to hell. Not we. They will walk the rest of us all the way there. Let's go find a ship with some tea on it. <laughs> <laughs> Kick this shit off. I, you know, I, 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 it's just, it's tough for me to stomach the professional sports atmosphere uh, the political spectrum. Hey, yeah. well, fortunately, we're going to have at least six months of it off because I'm sure the fucking 2024 oh, election will start in June. Yeah, it will. Yeah, 2024 is going to start like tomorrow. These people are not... <laughs> tomorrow. We're, gonna, I, to we're never going to end I'm this. I'm so saturated with it. I'm just like, fucking stop. I just... Well, all I was just like, man, like, 
I had to turn all politics off like yeah. a, a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks ago, whenever it was. And I just had to tune it the fuck out because it's just, it's, it's so fucking depressing at times where you're like, all right, I got to turn this off. I got to like do something else. Unfortunately, I had to step right back into it, you know, for a combination of reasons. <laughs> That was your own choice. I mean, you chose to sponsor Kyle, so... <laughs> God, no. It was a small package. Yeah. I tell you what, I have taken a lot of fucking heat for my stance with that kid. Really? It's, uh... I mean, I've been pretty open and honest about it. One, I don't think he had any business being there. I don't argue that, uh, you know, the actions he took were, it appears to be, in self-defense. But my right. issue with the whole thing is it was fucking avoidable. And there is a difference between a 17-year-old kid, which happens very infrequently, going into the military, and a 17-year-old kid who has self-admittedly executed the purchase of that rifle via straw man purchase with his uh, stimulus money. Mm -hmm. His 18-year-old friend bought it for him and gave it to him. Mm. Um, and again, that the legal system can handle that. I'm not going to put a value judgment on that. It's either legal or illegal. Right. Goes to that environment. And the thing is, you know, I can understand why he would want to make a difference, but where's the leadership around him? Where's his parents? Where are the people who are saying, hey, you know what? You're not in the military. Um, it's not your job or responsibility to do this. I can understand him wanting to be there and make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have said, well, all oh, the people he killed were felons. I'm like, yeah, he didn't fucking know that in the moment, though. And even if he did know that, it still doesn't make those actions justifiable just on that front alone. Like he was making decisions absent that information. Whether, whether or not he acted in self-defense, that'll be handled in the courtroom. Like I said, my own personal opinion after watching the videos, it seems that he was, but it was all avoidable. Well, exactly. All you know, fucking avoidable, man. If you go to a bar tonight looking to make sure that nobody does anything stupid and you get involved in a fight, you weren't there to start. What, what preceded you going there, even if the end result is you stopped a bully from doing something bad, right? Now, I just broke that down into something very soft. But that, you know, that kid precipitating that entire event was a long thought process and discourse with other people, right? He didn't do this in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And everybody that's like, oh, you know, you're not standing up for 2A. Like, you know what? I couldn't stand up more for the 2A. No, or, or guess you, what? Self-defense, which is a weird comment that was on your Instagram, like, yeah, we know you believe in the Second Amendment, but do you believe in self-defense? It's like, that's a fucking rhetorical question. Yeah, it's but all, all these guys that are out there, you know, screaming the, you have to defend the two. Like, where were you that day or that evening when a 17-year-old kid showed up? And if you're so pro 2A, you should know the fucking legality of him owning that firearm. And stop him and pull him aside and like, hey, man, what are you doing here? Yeah. Why, you know, right. where was the leadership there? Where, where was the community effort? In helping him, he could have avoided this entire scenario. An adult, an actual adult, and I'm saying that because he wasn't an adult, could have pulled him aside and said, hey, man, you know, we're really stoked you're here. You really shouldn't have that here. Go ahead and put it away. And you know what he wouldn't have done? He might not have walked down that street. He might not have ended, ended up getting into a scenario where he had to run and then defend himself with a weapon he shouldn't have had at an event he shouldn't have had the thing. You know, the leadership is a community effort. We don't operate in vacuums. And I really feel for that for that kid because he was allowed to operate in a manner that was purely crowdfunded. Hmm. They, and the actions they intellectually, can't be taken back. No, no the, in, the, they, they allowed this like intellectual crowdfunding and groupthink to go on yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Works fantastic. Very little. And, and there's other see, issues, too. I mean, let's be honest. The state and federal government should have handled that issue long before I think, yes, anybody I think, else was I, in the streets to have to handle that. And again, I like to go even out further of control. back to where your point is, yeah. which is these riots should have never been allowed to take place in the first place. Correct. Yeah. Like there should have never been a circumstance where they shouldn't civilians have gone this far. felt like they had to defend themselves. There should have never been a circumstance. And what happens is that now the onus or the reliability or not reliability, the um, what everything is basically resting on this kid that ultimately it wasn't his responsibility to stabilize and prevent. 
It was the responsibility of the state and the local government, and they failed in that. Yeah. So where is the accountability before this all, entire thing yeah. happened? Yeah. Where yeah. is that it's responsibility? It's left completely yeah. out it's of the left. conversation. It is. The state and it's, city failed the entire, both groups, both and, groups, and then his community failed him. Nobody should have felt. This shouldn't have happened. No person in their community Precisely. should have felt like they had to go and defend property against people that were going to destroy it, against criminals that were going to destroy their property. Yeah. What happened, I truly believe, is these local municipalities, they didn't stand up because they were afraid. They didn't push back. They didn't push back. They didn't want to take accountability for what was going to happen in, the, in this and these volatile are, situation. And those were a lot of elected officials that people in those municipalities are paying to not do anything. And, and so when we go back to they want to get reelected. Where, yeah, they want to get reelected. There's nobody standing up there taking accountability for that and no. say, this is my fault this ever happened. This should have never happened. Yeah, you don't see place. the mayor going, let's just, I'm really sorry he felt let, like he needed to defend himself. Where is the mayor in this? Where are the, the local and state officials that are resigning because this entire thing yeah. went down? Yeah. People should not be permitted to just burn down fucking no. businesses. We, should, in we should be seeing city councils stepping down. Yes. Not saying let's We're calling de- for let's town halls defund. every day. Like, let's fix this as a they group. They shouldn't be saying let's defund the police. That's the solution. Oh, well, that worked. Did you see how well that worked? Fantastic. It worked right. really fucking well. In the end, I feel terrible for Kyle and people can love or hate him. It's not about that. It's about the fact that a 17-year-old kid was thrust into an environment, whether voluntarily or absent good leadership, you know, whatever you want to describe it, he ended up there. And, and before even hitting the age of a legal adult, he was involved in something that's going to impact his life for the rest of his life. And I just, I feel yeah. for him because it was completely and utterly fucking avoidable. Yeah. yeah. You, you cannot revoke what happened. Yeah. And it shouldn't have happened for, from him being there to him purchasing it, to the community, to the municipality stopping Molotov cocktails going through windows. Right. You know, as far back as you want to step this, that's as far back as you can look at it as this is not just the actions of a single person doing yeah. one thing that caused all of it, right? He's not, he's not to blame for this. This isn't just his fault for being in the scenario. This is fucking everybody's fault. This, everybody's this is a fault. nightmare of a community failure. Well, you know? it's kind of like... I've thought about this a lot uh, over the last few years because when uh, guys were uh, going under scrutiny for war crimes, for instance, Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so where is the accountability of our senators and our congressmen in the the former White House for putting the soldiers to, to begin with in that circumstance? And profiting off of it. Correct. So where is the accountability there? Like, why is this 18-year-old kid, this 19-year-old kid or, or Marine, you know, that group of Marines that were tried a few years ago? Oh, that's right. They shouldn't have been there to begin with. So why were they there? And if we all sat there, we've all did the, the I think we're, we, have we all done, were you Iraq or just Afghanistan? Just Afghanistan. Not that it means anything. I'm just, you know, being in Iraq for four and a half years, give or take. It, I mean, it means something. That they were very different countries, yeah. for sure. It was a different yeah. experience. Very different experience. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about the accountability of every one of our elected fi- officials that has ultimately landed us there, and then thinking about the long-term effects in the Middle East, thinking about, you know, uh, I, I go I go back to that simple meme of the the kid on the bus that Simpsons yeah. character. Where he's like, I'm in danger. <laughs> it's like the Middle East is is that kid is that kid because now when we look at the political establishment that's, that could possibly <laughs> step in, looking at how people are held accountable and they're not because they're absolutely not held accountable. We're teeing other soldiers to go over at 18 years old to burden the responsibility of combat actions and then make very definitive choices that are make or break with a non-fully developed brain as you're getting fucking shot at and watching your fucking buddies get blown up. I don't know. Maybe people need to have a little bit more empathy in those situations for the individual and why did they end up there to begin with? And then follow the chain of accountability because that's the way every fucking corporation in America works. I don't get to just fucking opt out of something stupid that my employees do. I don't get to do that. I have to take accountability and I have to take action. So 
there is a long-term effect, I think, of politicians not being held accountable and ultimately being able to lie because, I mean, that's what they do. They get to just fucking lie and they get to spin whatever narrative they want and they can dig themselves out of the hole by winning favor in a news cycle or whatever it might be. Uh, it's truly when I look at this and I say, you know, when we look at even the Benghazi incident, you know, some of the bigger incidents that mm. have happened in our fucking niece or near history. Why were those guys duking it out for their lives on the, on the rooftop in Benghazi? What, what were the actions that led up to that event? Yeah. Or the in, lack of actions, lack of actions. Uh, what were the things that we could have done to prevent that from happening earlier on? And where are the, elected officials stepping into the hole going, this is my fault, not their fault. Don't blame them. This is my fault. Not one person all the way up the fucking chain of command took responsibility for that. It was actually the opposite. It was exactly the opposite. People didn't get fired. People didn't get their clearances revoked. People didn't get fucking moved. They didn't go to jail. They said, it's not my fault. Yeah. They jumped out of the way. Like there was a runaway train coming out. Yeah, they did. Yeah, which tells me they're all selfish, self-entitled, and they have one objective. The people are like Re-election. individual grains of sand on the side on the sidewalk that they're walking to get to where they need to go. That's yeah. all they're doing. Wow, did I did I just depress you? I'm thinking. <laughs> this is my thinking face. That's your pensive thinking face. Yeah, it's, it's a great stocking cap. It really is. Your wife nailed it. This is from our bear trip last year no moose moose yeah. well i wouldn't know because i didn't fucking see a moose the entire time i did last well, day yeah good for you hmm. I, I hope you missed last day. no i didn't i hope the you meat spoiled i, I, I hope didn't. the meat spoiled before you got to it i and had you know. trigonosis we both ran it across the border mm-hmm. we'll hope you home. didn't declare it in the canadian mounties come and find you <laughs> 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 Is that it, Andy? Break until tomorrow. We Round, still have okay. tomorrow. Too. Round yeah, one. Exactly. What time is your guys' flight? Complete. I don't know. Uh, Mike. I think. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know what, don't what time know. our flight is. Daytime. Yeah. Daytime. It's noon, I think. Give or take. Perfect. We can hit another one in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why not? I think we've been at it for two and a half anyway. Have we really? Closing thoughts, Trevor. When are you starting jujitsu? Um. Mm-hmm. Good oh, answer. No. Closing yeah. thoughts, Evan. Sounds like tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Travis man. wouldn't give a fuck. He'd be like, "Sign the." I just had the Christensen Arms crew. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think I have signed the waiver already. They came up and maybe like, twice. Andy said he wants to roll with us. Is that okay? And he just shakes his head. He's like, "Go sign the fucking waiver." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sign the waiver. Good job, dummy. That's the first. And then I actually, actually, after the experience with Jocko, I have a conversation. I'm like, do you understand the theory of tapping? You can end this at any time verbally, with your feet, with your hands. You can say tap. You can screen tap. We can just just tap when you're uncomfortable. And they're like, okay. <laughs> now sign this. Now sign this. The waiver's this. first. And that conversation is after the waiver. Right. Travis just shakes his head and fucking laughs. He's like, just fucking sign the waiver. Just sign the fucking waiver. Yeah. What's your belt anyway right now? Blue. Same. Blue. Yeah. I just try to tap people to that Black Rifle logo on the gi. It's yeah, awesome. Because it gets second. super sweaty and just drive it into their face hole. <laughs> people are asking which face hole, whatever one I want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For as long as I want to, unless I'm on the bottom. And then I just try to get up. Well, thanks, Andy. I appreciate it, buddy. Steaks. I mean, I go pick up yeah. some steaks. Let's go get some steaks. Put them on the trigger. All right.